Part One of The Light Princess From The Light Princess and Other Fairy Tales by George MacDonald This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Clive Catterall The Light Princess and Other Fairy Tales by George MacDonald Part One Chapter One. What? No children? Once upon a time, so long ago that I have quite forgotten the date, there lived a king and queen who had no children. And the king said to himself, All the queens of my acquaintance have children, some three, some seven, and some as many as twelve, and my queen has not one. I feel ill-used. So he made up his mind to be cross with his wife about it. But she bore it all like a good patient queen as she was. Then the king grew very cross indeed, but the queen pretended to take it all as a joke, and a very good one too. "'Why don't you have any daughters, at least?' said he. "'I don't say sons. That might be too much to expect.' "'I'm sure, dear king, I'm very sorry,' said the queen. "'So you ought to be,' retorted the king. "'You're not going to make a virtue of that, surely?' But he was not an ill-tempered king, and in any matter of less moment would have let the queen have her own way with all his heart. This, however, was an affair of state. The queen smiled. "'You must have patience with a lady, you know, dear king,' said she. She was, indeed, a very nice queen, and heartily sorry that she could not oblige the king immediately. The king tried to have patience, but it succeeded very badly. It was more than he deserved, therefore, when, at last, the queen gave him a daughter, as lovely a little princess as ever cried. CHAPTER Two, WON'T I JUST? The day drew near when the infant must be christened. The king wrote all the invitations with his own hand. Of course, somebody was forgotten. Now, it does not generally matter if somebody is forgotten, and he must mind who. Unfortunately, the king forgot without intending to forget, and so the chance fell upon the Princess Mekenwa, which was awkward. For the princess was the king's own sister, and he ought not to have forgotten her. But she had made herself so disagreeable to the old king, their father, that he had forgotten her in making his will and so it was no wonder that her brother forgot her in writing his invitations. But poor relations don't do anything to keep you in mind of them, why don't they? The king could not see into the garret she lived in, could he? She was a sour, spiteful creature. The wrinkles of contempt crossed the wrinkles of peevishness, and made her face as full of wrinkles as a pat of butter. If ever a king could be justified in forgetting anybody, this king was justified in forgetting his sister, even at a christening. She looked very odd, too. Her forehead was as large as all the rest of her face, and projected over it like a precipice. When she was angry, her little eyes flashed blue. When she hated anybody, they shone yellow and green. What they looked like when she loved anybody, I don't know, for I never heard of her loving anybody but herself, and I do not think she could have managed that if she had not somehow got used to herself. But what made it highly imprudent in the king to forget her was that she was awfully clever. In fact, she was a witch, and when she bewitched anybody he very soon had enough of it, for she beat all the wicked fairies in wickedness, and all the clever ones in cleverness. She despised all the modes we read in history in which offended fairies and witches have taken their revenges, and therefore after waiting and waiting in vain for an invitation, she made up her mind at last to go without one, and make the whole family miserable, like a princess as she was. So she put on her best gown, went to the palace, was kindly received by the happy monarch, who forgot that he had forgotten her, and took her place in the procession to the royal chapel. When they were all gathered about the font, she contrived to get next to it and throw something into the water, after which she maintained a very respectful demeanour till the water was applied to the child's face. But at that moment 
she turned round in her place three times and muttered the following words, loud enough for those beside her to hear. Light of spirit, by my charms, light of body every part, never weary human arms, only crush thy parent's heart. They all thought she had lost her wits, and was repeating some foolish nursery rhyme, but a shudder went through the whole of them notwithstanding. The baby, on the contrary, began to laugh and crow, while the nurse gave a start and a smothered cry, for she thought she was struck with paralysis. She could not feel the baby in her arms, but she clasped it tight and said nothing. The mischief was done. Chapter 3 She Can't Be Ours Her atrocious aunt had deprived the child of all her gravity. If you ask me how this was effected, I answer, in the easiest way in the world, she had only to destroy gravitation. For the princess was a philosopher, and knew all the ins and outs of the laws of gravitation, as well as the ins and outs of her bootlace. And being a witch as well, she could abrogate those laws in a moment, or at least so clog their wheels and rust their bearings, that they would not work at all. But we have more to do with what followed than how it was done. The first awkwardness that resulted from this unhappy privation was that the moment the nurse began to float the baby up and down she flew from her arms towards the ceiling. Happily the resistance of the air brought her ascending career to a close within a foot of it. There she remained, horizontal as when she left the nurse's arms, kicking and laughing amazingly. The nurse, in a terror, flew to the bell, and begged the footman, who answered it, to bring up the house-steps directly. Trembling in every limb, she climbed upon the steps, and had to stand upon the very top to reach up, before she could catch the floating tail of the baby's long clothes. When the strange fact came to be known, there was a terrible commotion in the palace. The occasion of its discovery by the king was naturally a repetition of the nurse's experience. Astonished that he felt no weight when the child was laying in his arms, he began to wave her up and not down, for she slowly ascended to the ceiling as before, and there remained, floating in perfect comfort and satisfaction, as was testified by her peals of tiny laughter. The king stood staring up in speechless amazement, and trembled so that his beard shook like grass in the wind. At last, turning to the queen, who was just as horror-struck as himself, he said, gasping, staring, and stammering, "'She can't be ours, queen!' Now the queen was much cleverer than the king, and had begun to suspect that this effect defective came by cause. "'I am sure she is ours,' answered she. "'But we ought to have taken better care of her at the christening. People who were never invited ought not to have been present.' "'Oh, ho!' said the king, tapping his forehead with his forefinger. "'I have it all! I have found her out! Don't you see it, queen? Princess Mekemnois has bewitched her!' "'That's just what I say,' answered the queen. "'Oh, I beg your pardon, my love, I did not hear you. John, bring the steps I get on my throne with.' For he was a little king with a great throne, like many other kings. The throne steps were brought and set upon the dining-table and John got upon the top of them, but he could not reach the little princess, who lay like a baby laughter-cloud in the air, exploding continuously. "'Take the tongs, John,' said his majesty, and getting up on the table, he handed them to him. John could reach the baby now, and the little princess was handed down by the tongs. Chapter 4 Where is she? One fine summer day, a month after these her first adventures, during which time she had been very carefully watched, the princess was lying on the bed in the queen's own chamber, fast asleep. One of the windows was open, for it was noon, and the day so sultry that the little girl was wrapped in nothing less ethereal than slumber itself. The queen came into the room, and not observing that the baby was on the bed, opened another window. A frolicsome fairy wind, which had been watching for a chance of mischief, rushed in at the one window, and taking its way over the bed where the child was lying, caught her up, 
and rolling and floating her along like a piece of flue or a dandelion seed, carried her with it through the opposite window and away. The queen went downstairs, quite ignorant of the loss she had herself occasioned. When the nurse returned, she supposed that Her Majesty had carried her off, and, dreading a scolding, delayed making inquiry about her. But hearing nothing, she grew uneasy, and went at length to the Queen's boudoir, where she found Her Majesty. "'Please, Your Majesty, shall I take the baby?' said she. "'Where is she?' asked the Queen. "'Please forgive me. I know it was wrong.' "'What do you mean?' said the Queen, looking grave. "'Oh, don't frighten me, Your Majesty!' exclaimed the nurse, clasping her hands. The Queen saw that something was amiss, and fell down in a faint. The nurse rushed about the palace, screaming, "'My baby! My baby!' Everyone ran to the Queen's room, but the Queen could give no orders. They soon found out, however, that the Princess was missing, and in a moment the palace was like a beehive in the garden, and in one minute more the Queen was brought to herself by a great shout and a clapping of hands. They had found the Princess fast asleep under a rose-bush, to which the elvish little wind-puff had carried her, finishing its mischief by shaking a shower of red rose-leaves all over the little white sleeper. Startled by the noise the servants made, she woke, and, furious with glee, scattered the rose-leaves in all directions like a shower of spray in the sunset. She was watched more carefully after this, no doubt. Yet it would be endless to relate all the odd incidents resulting from this peculiarity of the young princess. But there was never a baby in a house, not to say a palace, that kept the household in such constant good humour, at least below stairs. If it was not easy for her nurses to hold her, at least she made neither their arms nor their hearts ache. And she was so nice to play at ball with, there was positively no danger of letting her fall. They might throw her down, or knock her down, or push her down, but couldn't let her down. It is true, they might let her fly into the fire, or the coal-hole, or through the window, but none of these accidents had happened as yet. If you heard peals of laughter resounding from some unknown region, you might be sure of the cause. Going down into the kitchen, or into the room, you would find Jane and Thomas, and Robert and Susan, all and some, playing at ball with the little princess, and she was the ball herself, and did not enjoy it the less for that. Away she went, flying from one to another, screeching with laughter, and the servants loved the ball itself better even than the game. But they had to take some care how they threw her, for if she received an upward direction she would never come down again without being fetched. CHAPTER V. WHAT IS TO BE DONE? But above stairs it was different. One day, for instance, after breakfast, the king went into his counting-house and counted out his money. The operation gave him no pleasure. Mm, to think, he said to himself, that every one of these gold sovereigns weighs a quarter of an ounce, and my real live flesh-and-blood princess weighs nothing at all. And he hated his gold sovereigns as they lay with a broad smile of self-satisfaction all over their yellow faces. The queen was in the parlour, eating bread and honey. But at the second mouthful she burst out crying and could not swallow it. The king heard her sobbing. Glad of anybody, but especially of his queen, to quarrel with, he clashed his gold sovereigns into his money-box, clapped his crown on his head, and rushed into the parlour. "'What is all this about?' exclaimed he. "'What are you crying for, queen?' "'I can't eat it,' said the queen, looking ruefully at the honey-pot. "'No wonder,' retorted the king. You've just eaten your breakfast, two turkey eggs and three anchovies. Oh, that's not it, sobbed Her Majesty. It's my child, my child. Well, what's the matter with your child? She's neither up the chimney nor down the draw-well. Just hear her laughing. Yet the king could not help a sigh, which he tried to turn into a cough, saying, <laughs> It's not a good thing to be light-hearted, I'm sure, whether she be ours or not. "'It is a bad thing to be light-headed,' answered the Queen, looking with prophetic soul far into the future. "'Tis a good thing to be light-handed,' said the King. "'Tis a bad thing to be light-fingered,' answered the Queen. "'Tis a good thing to be light-footed,' said the King. 
"'Tis a bad thing,' began the Queen, but the King interrupted her. "'In fact,' said he, with the tone of one who concludes an argument in which he has had only imaginary opponents, and in which, therefore, he has come off triumphant, "'in fact, it is a good thing altogether to be light-bodied.' "'But it is a bad thing altogether to be light-minded,' retorted the Queen, who was beginning to lose her temper. This last answer quite discomfited His Majesty, who turned on his heel and betook himself to his counting-house again. But he was not half-way towards it when the voice of his Queen overtook him. "'And it's a bad thing to be light-haired!' screamed she, determined to have more last words, now that her spirit was roused. The Queen's hair was black as night, but the King's had been, and his daughter's was, golden as morning. But it was not this reflection on his hair that arrested him. It was the double use of the word light, for the King hated all witticisms, and punning especially. And besides, he could not tell whether the Queen meant light-haired or light-aired, for why might she not aspirate her vowels when she was exasperated herself? He turned upon his other heel and rejoined her. She looked angry still, because she knew that she was guilty, or, what was much the same, knew that he thought her so. "'My dear Queen,' said he, "'duplicity of any sort is exceedingly objectionable between married people of any rank, not to say kings and queens. And the most objectionable form duplicity can assume is that of punning.' "'There,' said the Queen, "'I never made a jest, but I broke it in the making.' and the most unfortunate woman in the world. She looked so rueful that the king took her in his arms, and they sat down to consult. "'Can you bear this?' said the king. "'No, I can't,' said the queen. "'Well, what's to be done?' said the king. "'I'm sure I don't know,' said the queen. "'But might you not try an apology?' "'To my old sister, I suppose you mean,' said the king. "'Yes.' said the Queen. "'Well, I don't mind,' said the King. So he went the next morning to the house of the Princess, and, making a very humble apology, begged her to undo the spell. But the Princess declared, with a grave face, that she knew nothing at all about it. Her eyes, however, shone pink, which was a sign that she was happy. She advised the King and Queen to have patience, and to mend their ways. The king returned disconsolate. The queen tried to comfort him. We will wait till she is older. She may then be able to suggest something herself. She will know at least how she feels, and explain things to us. But what if she should marry? exclaimed the king in sudden consternation at the idea. Well, what of that? rejoined the queen. Just think. If she were to have children, in the course of a hundred years, the air might be as full of floating children as of gossamers in autumn. That's no business of ours, replied the Queen. Besides, by that time they will have learned to take care of themselves. A sigh was the King's only answer. He would have consulted the court physicians, but he was afraid they would try experiments upon her. CHAPTER Six. SHE LAUGHS TOO MUCH Meantime, notwithstanding awkward occurrences and griefs that she brought upon her parents, the little princess laughed and grew not fat, but plump and tall. She reached the age of seventeen, without having fallen into any worse scrape than a chimney, by rescuing her from which a little bird-nesting urchin got fame and a black face. Nor, thoughtless as she was, had she committed anything worse than laughter at everybody and everything that came in her way. When she was told, for the sake of experiment, that General Clanranfort was cut to pieces with all his troops, she laughed. When she heard that the enemy was on his way to besiege her papa's capital, she laughed hugely. But when she was told that the city would certainly be abandoned to the mercy of the enemy's soldiery, why, then she laughed immoderately. She never could be brought to see the serious side of anything. When her mother cried, she said, what queer faces Mamma makes! And she squeezes water out of her cheeks, funny Mamma! And when her papa stormed at her, she laughed, and danced around and round him, clapping her hands and crying, Do it again, Papa! Do it again! It's such fun! Dear funny Papa! 
and if he tried to catch her, she glided from him in an instant, not in the least afraid of him, but thinking it part of the game not to be caught. With one push of her foot she would be floating in the air above his head, or she would go dancing backwards and forwards and sideways, like a great butterfly. It happened several times, when her father and mother were holding a consultation about her in private, that they were interrupted by vainly repressed outbursts of laughter over their heads, and looking up with indignation, saw her floating at full length in the air above them, whence she regarded them with a most comical appreciation of the position. One day an awkward accident happened. The princess had come out upon the lawn with one of her attendants, who held her by the hand. Spying her father at the other end of the lawn, she snatched her hand from the maids, and sped across to him. Now, when she wanted to run alone, her custom was to catch up a stone in each hand, so that she might come down again after a bound. Whatever she wore as part of her attire had no effect in this way. Even gold, when it thus became, as it were, a part of herself, lost all its weight for the time. But whatever she only held in her hands retained its downward tendency. On this occasion she could see nothing to catch up but a huge toad that was walking across the lawn as if he had a hundred years to do it in. Not knowing what disgust meant, for this was one of her peculiarities, she snatched up the toad and bounded away. She had almost reached her father, and he was holding out his arms to receive her, and take from her lips the kiss which hovered on them like a butterfly on a rosebud, when a puff of wind blew her aside into the arms of a young page, who had just been receiving a message from His Majesty. Now, it was no great peculiarity in the princess that, once she was set going, it always cost her time and trouble to check herself. On this occasion there was no time. She must kiss, and she kissed the page. She did not mind it much, for she had no shyness in her composition, and she knew, besides, that she could not help it. So she only laughed like a musical box. The poor page fared the worst, for the princess, trying to correct the unfortunate tendency of the kiss, put out her hands to keep her off the page, so that along with a kiss he received, on the other cheek, a slap with a huge black toad which she poked right into his eye. He tried to laugh, too, but the attempt resulted in such an odd contortion of countenance as showed that there was no danger of his pluming himself on the kiss. As for the king, his dignity was greatly hurt, and he did not speak to the page for a whole month. I may here remark that it was very amusing to see her run, if her mode of progression could properly be called running. For first she would make a bound, then, having alighted, she would run a few steps and make another bound. Sometimes she would fancy she had reached the ground before she actually had, and her feet would go backwards and forwards, running upon nothing at all, like those of a chicken on its back. Then she would laugh like the very spirit of fun, only in her laugh there was something missing. What it was I find myself unable to describe. I think it was a certain tone depending on the possibility of sorrow, morbidezza, perhaps. She never smiled. End of Part 1 of The Light Princess Part 2 of The Light Princess From The Light Princess and Other Fairy Tales by George MacDonald This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Clive Catterall Part Two of The Light Princess From The Light Princess and Other Fairy Tales by George MacDonald Chapter Seven Try Metaphysics After a long avoidance of the painful subject, the king and queen resolved to hold a council of three upon it, and so they sent for the princess. In she came, sliding and flitting and gliding from one piece of furniture to another, and put herself at last in an armchair in a sitting posture. 
whether she could be said to sit, seeing she received no support from the seat of the chair, I do not pretend to determine. "'My dear child,' said the king, "'you must be aware by this time that you are not exactly like other people.' "'Oh, you dear funny papa! I have got a nose and two eyes, and all the rest. So have you. So has mamma. "'Now be serious, my dear, for once,' said the queen. "'No, thank you, mamma. I'd rather not.' "'Would you not like to be able to walk like other people?' said the king. "'No, indeed. I should think not. You only crawl. You are such slow coaches.' "'How do you feel, my child?' he resumed, after a pause of discomfiture. "'Quite well, thank you. I mean, what do you feel like?' "'Like nothing at all that I know of.' "'You must feel like something.' i feel like a princess with such a funny papa and such a dear pet of a queen mamma now really began the queen but the princess interrupted her oh yes she added i remember i have a curious feeling sometimes as if i were the only person that had any sense in the whole world she had been trying to behave herself with dignity but now she burst into a violent fit of laughter threw herself backwards over the chair and went rolling about the floor in an ecstasy of enjoyment. The king picked her up easier than one does a down quilt, and replaced her in her former relation to the chair. The exact preposition expressing this relation I do not happen to know. "'Is there nothing you wish for?' resumed the king, who had learned by this time that it was quite useless to be angry with her. "'Oh, you dear papa, yes!' answered she. "'What is it, my darling? "'I have been longing for it, oh, such a time, ever since last night.' "'Tell me what it is.' "'Will you promise to let me have it?' The king was on the point of saying yes, but the wiser queen checked him with a single motion of her head. "'Tell me what it is first, said he. "'No, no, promise first. "'I dare not. What is it? "'Mind, I hold you to your promise.' It is to be tied to the end of a string, a very long string indeed, and be flown like a kite. Oh, such fun! I would rain rosewater, and hail sugar plums, and snow whipped cream, and—and and, a fit of laughing checked her, and she would have been off again over the floor had not the king started up and caught her just in time. Seeing nothing but talk could be got out of her, he rang the bell and sent her away with two of her ladies in waiting. "'Now, Queen,' he said, turning to Her Majesty, "'what is to be done?' "'There is but one thing left,' answered she. "'Let us consult the College of Metaphysicians.' "'Bravo!' cried the King. "'We will!' Now, at the head of this college were two very wise Chinese philosophers, by name Humdrum and Kopi Kek. For them the King sent, and straight away they came. In a long speech he communicated to them what they knew very well already, as who did not, namely the peculiar condition of his daughter in relation to the globe on which she dwelt, and requested them to consult together as to what might be the cause and probable cure of her infirmity. The king laid stress upon the word, but failed to discover his own pun. The queen laughed, but humdrum and copy keck, heard with humility and retired in silence. The consultation consisted chiefly in propounding and supporting, for the thousandth time, each his favourite theories. For the condition of the princess afforded delightful scope for the discussion of every question arising from the division of thought, in fact, of all the metaphysics of the Chinese Empire. But it is only justice to say that they did not altogether neglect the discussion of the practical question, what was to be done. Humdrum was a materialist, and Kopi Kek was a spiritualist. The former was slow and sententious, the latter was quick and flighty. The latter had generally the first word, the former the last. "'I reassert my former assertion,' began Kopi Kek with a plunge. There is not a fault in the princess, body or soul, only they are wrong put together. Listen to me now, Humdrum, 
and I will tell you in brief what I think. Don't speak, don't answer me. I won't hear you till I have done. At that decisive moment, when souls seek their appointed habitations, two eager souls met, struck, rebounded, lost their way, and arrived each at the wrong place. The soul of the princess was one of those, and she went far astray. She does not belong by rights to this world at all, but some other planet, probably Mercury. Her proclivity to her true sphere destroys all the natural influence which this orb would otherwise possess over her corporeal frame. She cares for nothing here. There is no relation between her and this world. She must therefore be taught, by the sternest compulsion, to take an interest in the earth as the earth. She must study every department of its history, its animal history, its vegetable history, its mineral history, its social history, its moral history, its political history, its scientific history, its literary history, its musical history, its artistical history, above all, its metaphysical history. She must begin with the Chinese dynasty and end with Japan. But first of all, she must study geology and especially the history of the extinct races of animals, their natures, their habits, their loves, their hates, their revenges, she must— Hold! Hold! roared Humdrum. It is certainly my turn now. My rooted and insubvertible conviction is that the cause of the anomalies evident in the princess's condition are strictly and solely physical. But that is only tantamount to acknowledging that they exist. Hear my opinion. From some cause or other, of no importance to our inquiry, the motion of her heart has been reversed. That remarkable combination of the suction and the force pump works the wrong way. I mean, in the case of the princess, it draws in where it should force out, and forces out where it should draw in. The offices of the auricles and the ventricles are subverted. The blood is sent forth by the veins and returns by the arteries. Consequently, it is running the wrong way through all her corporeal organism, lungs and all. Is it then at all mysterious, seeing that such is the case, that on the other particular of gravitation as well, she should differ from normal humanity? My proposal for the cure is this. Phlebotomize until she is reduced to the last point of safety. Let it be effected, if necessary, in a warm bath, when she is reduced to the state of perfect asphyxy. Apply a ligature to the left ankle, drawing it as tight as the bone will bear. Apply, at the same moment, another of equal tension around the right wrist. By means of plates constructed for the purpose, place the other foot and hand under the receivers of two air pumps. Exhaust the receivers. Exhibit a pint of French brandy and wait the result. Which would presently arrive in the form of grim death, said Copy Keck. If it should, she would yet die in doing our duty retorted humdrum but their majesties had too much tenderness for their volatile offspring to subject her to either of the schemes of the equally unscrupulous philosophers indeed the most complete knowledge of the laws of nature would have been unserviceable in her case for it was impossible to classify her she was a fifth imponderable body sharing all the other properties of the ponderable chapter eight Try a drop of water. Perhaps the best thing for the princess would have been to fall in love. But how a princess who had no gravity could fall into anything is a difficulty, perhaps the difficulty. As for her own feelings on the subject, she did not even know that there was such a beehive of honey and stings to be fallen into. But now I come to mention another curious fact about her. The palace was built on the shore of the loveliest lake in the world, and the princess loved this lake more than father or mother. The root of this preference, no doubt, although the princess did not recognise it as such, was that the moment she got into it, she recovered the natural right of which she had been so wickedly deprived, namely, gravity. Whether this was owing to the fact that water had been employed as the means of conveying the injury, I do not know, but it is certain that she could swim and dive like the duck that her old nurse said she was. 
the manner in which this alleviation of her misfortune was discovered was as follows. One summer evening, during the carnival of the country, she had been taken upon the lake by the king and queen in the royal barge. They were accompanied by many of the courtiers in a fleet of little boats. In the middle of the lake she wanted to get into the Lord Chancellor's barge, for his daughter, who was a great favourite with her, was in it with her father. Now, though the old king rarely condescended to make light of his misfortune, yet happening on this occasion to be in a particularly good humour, as the barges approached each other, he caught up the princess to throw her into the Chancellor's barge. He lost his balance, however, and, dropping into the bottom of the barge, lost hold of his daughter. Not, however, before imparting to her the downward tendency of his own person, though in a somewhat different direction. For, as the king fell into the boat, she fell into the water. With a burst of delightful laughter she disappeared into the lake. A cry of horror ascended from the boats. They had never seen the princess go down before. Half the men were under water in a moment, but they had all, one after another, come up to the surface again for breath, when tinkle, tinkle, babble and gush came the princess's laugh over the water from far away. There she was, swimming like a swan. Nor would she come out for king or queen, chancellor or daughter. She was perfectly obstinate. But at the same time she seemed more sedate than usual. Perhaps that was because a great pleasure spoils laughing. At all events, after this, the passion of her life was to get into the water, and she was always the better behaved, and the more beautiful, the more she had of it. Summer and winter was quite the same, only she would not stay so long in the water when they had to break the ice to let her in. Any day, from morning till evening in summer, she might be decried a streak of white in the blue water lying as still as a shadow of a cloud, or shooting along like a dolphin, disappearing and coming up again far off, just where one did not expect her. She would have been in the lake of a night, too, if she could have had her way, for the balcony of her window overhung a deep pool in it, and through a shallow, reedy passage she could have swum out into the wide, wet water, and no one would have been any the wiser. Indeed, when she happened to wake in the moonlight, she could hardly resist the temptation. But well, there was the sad difficulty of getting into it. She had as great a dread of the air as some children have of the water, for the slightest gust of wind would blow her away, and a gust might arise in the stillest moment, and if she gave herself a push towards the water and just failed of reaching it, her situation would be dreadfully awkward, irrespective of the wind for at best there she would have to remain suspended in her nightgown till she was seen and angled for by someone from the window. Oh, if I had my gravity, thought she, contemplating the water, I would flash off this balcony like a long white seabird headlong into the darling wetness. Hey-ho! This was the only consideration that made her wish to be like other people. Another reason for her being fond of the water was that in it alone she enjoyed any freedom, for she could not walk out without a cortege consisting in part of a troop of light horse, for fear of the liberties which the wind might take with her. And the king grew more apprehensive with increasing years, till at last he would not allow her to walk abroad at all without some twenty silken cords fastened to as many parts of her dress and held by twenty noblemen. Of course, horseback was out of the question, but she bade good-bye to all this ceremony when she got into the water. And so remarkable were its effects upon her, especially in restoring her for the time to the ordinary human gravity, that Humdrum and Copykeck agreed in recommending that the king to bury her alive for three years, in the hope that, as the water did her so much good, the earth would do her yet more. But the king had some vulgar prejudices against the experiment, and would not give his consent. Foiled in this, they yet agreed in another recommendation, which, seeing that the one imported his opinions from China and the other from Tibet, 
was very remarkable indeed. They argued that if water of external origin and application could be so efficacious, water from a deeper source might work a perfect cure. In short, that if the poor afflicted princess could be by any means made to cry, she might recover her lost gravity. But how was this to be brought about? Therein lay all the difficulty, to meet which the philosophers were not wise enough. To make the princess cry was as impossible as to make her way. They sent for a professional beggar, commanded him to prepare his most touching oracles of woe, helped him out of the court charade box to whatever he wanted for dressing up, and promising great rewards in the event of his success. But it was all in vain. She listened to the mendicant artist's story, and gazed at his marvellous make-up, till she could contain herself no longer, and went into the most undignified contortions for relief, shrieking and positively screeching with laughter. When she had a little recovered herself, she ordered her attendants to drive him away, and not give him a single copper, whereupon his look of mortified discomfiture wrought her punishment and his revenge, for it sent her into violent hysterics, from which she was with difficulty recovered. But so anxious was the king that the suggestion should have a fair trial, that he put himself in a rage one day, and rushing up to her room gave her an awful whipping. Yet not a tear would flow. She looked grave, and her laughing sounded uncommonly like screaming. That was all. The good old tyrant, though he put on his best gold spectacles to look, could not discover the smallest cloud in the serene blue of her eyes. CHAPTER Nine, PUT ME IN AGAIN It must have been about this time that the son of a king, who lived a thousand miles from Lagabel, set out to look for the daughter of a queen. He travelled far and wide, but as sure as he found a princess, he found some fault in her. Of course, he could not marry a mere woman, however beautiful, and there were no princesses to be found worthy of him. Whether the prince was so near perfection that he had a right to demand perfection itself, I cannot pretend to say. All I know is that he was a fine, handsome, brave, generous, well-bred and well-behaved youth, as all princes are. In his wanderings he had come across some reports about our princess, but as everybody said she was bewitched, he never dreamed that she could bewitch him. For what, indeed, could a prince do with a princess that had lost her gravity? Who could tell what she might not lose next? She might lose her visibility or her tangibility, or, in short, the power of making impressions upon the radical sensorium, so that he should never be able to tell whether she was dead or alive. Of course he made no further inquiries about her. One day he lost sight of his retinue in a great forest. These forests are very useful in delivering princes from their courtiers, like a sieve that keeps back the bran. Then the princes get away to follow their fortunes. In this they have the advantage of the princesses, who are forced to marry before they have had a bit of fun. I wish our princesses got lost in a forest sometimes. One lovely evening, after wandering about for many days, he found that he was approaching the outskirts of this forest for the trees had got so thin that he could see the sunset through them, and he soon came upon a kind of heath. Next he came upon signs of human neighbourhood, but by this time it was getting late, and there was nobody in the fields to direct him. After travelling for another hour, his horse, quite worn out with long labour and lack of food, fell, and was unable to rise again. So he continued his journey on foot. At length he entered another wood, not a wild forest, but a civilised wood, through which a footpath led him to the side of a lake. Along this path the prince pursued his way through the gathering darkness. Suddenly he paused and listened. Strange sounds came across the water. It was, in fact, the princess laughing. 
now there was something odd in her laugh, as I have already hinted, for the hatching of a real hearty laugh requires the incubation of gravity, and perhaps this was how the prince mistook the laughter for screaming. Looking over the lake, he saw something white in the water, and in an instant he had torn off his tunic, kicked off his sandals, and plunged in. He soon reached the white object, and found that it was a woman. There was not light enough to show that she was a princess, but quite enough to show that she was a lady, for it does not want much light to see that. Now, I cannot tell how it came about, whether she pretended to be drowning, or whether he frightened her, or caught her so as to embarrass her, but certainly he brought her to the shore in a fashion ignominious to a swimmer, and more nearly drowned than she had ever expected to be, for the water had got into her throat as often as she had tried to speak. At the place to which he bore her, the bank was only a foot or two above the water, so he gave her a strong lift out of the water to lay her on the bank. But her gravitation ceasing the moment she left the water, away she went, up into the air, scolding and screaming. "'You naughty, 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 naughty man!' she cried. No one had ever succeeded in putting her into a passion before. When the prince saw her ascend, he thought he must have been bewitched, and had mistaken a great swan for a lady. But the princess caught hold of the topmost cone of a lofty fir. This came off, but she caught at another, and, in fact, stopped herself by gathering cones, dropping them as the stocks gave way. The prince, meantime, stood in the water, staring, and forgetting to get out. With the princess disappearing, he scrambled on shore and went in the direction of the tree. There he found her climbing down one of the branches towards the stem, but in the darkness of the wood the prince continued in some bewilderment as to what the phenomenon could be, until reaching the ground and seeing him standing there, she caught hold of him and said, "'I'll tell Papa.' "'Oh, no, you won't,' returned the prince. "'Yes, I will,' she persisted. "'What business had you to pull me down out of the water "'and throw me to the bottom of the air? "'I never did you any harm. "'Pardon me, I did not mean to hurt you. "'I don't believe you have any brains, "'and that is a worse loss than your wretched gravity. "'I pity you.' "'The prince now saw that he had come upon a bewitched princess, "'and had already offended her. "'But before he could think what to say next, "'she burst out angrily, giving a stamp with her foot that would have sent her aloft again but for the hold she had of his arm. "'Put me up directly!' Uh, "'Put you up where, you beauty?' asked the prince. He had fallen in love with her almost already, for her anger made her more charming than any one else he had ever beheld, and as far as he could see, which certainly was not far, she had not a single fault about her except, of course, that she had not any gravity. No prince, however, would judge of a princess by weight. The loveliness of her foot he could certainly estimate by the depth of the impression it could make in the mud. "'Put you up where, you beauty?' asked the prince. "'In the water, you stupid!' answered the princess. "'Come, then,' said the prince. The condition of her dress, increasing her usual difficulty in walking, compelled her to cling to him and he could hardly persuade himself that he was not in a delightful dream, notwithstanding the torrent of musical abuse with which she overwhelmed him. The prince, being, therefore, in no hurry, they came upon the lake at quite another part, where the bank was twenty-five feet high at least, and when they had reached the edge he turned towards the princess and said, "'How am I to put you in?' "'That's your business,' she answered quite snappishly. "'You took me out. Put me in again!' "'Very well,' said the prince, and, catching her up in his arms, he sprang with her from the rock. The princess had just time to give one delighted shriek of laughter before the water closed over them. When they came to the surface, she found that, for a moment or two, she could not even laugh, for she had gone down with such a rush that it was with difficulty she recovered her breath. The instant they reached the surface, "'How do you like falling in?' said the prince. After some effort the princess pouted out, "'Is that what you call falling in?' "'Yes,' answered the prince. "'I should think it a very tolerable specimen.' 
"'It seemed to me like going up,' rejoined she. "'My feeling was certainly one of elevation, too,' the prince conceded. The princess did not appear to understand him, for she retorted his question. "'How do you like falling in?' said the princess. "'Beyond everything,' answered he, "'for I have fallen in with the only perfect creature I ever saw.' "'Oh, no more of that. I'm tired of it,' said the princess. Perhaps she shared her father's aversion to punning. "'Don't you like falling in, then?' said the prince. "'It is the most delightful fun I have ever had in my life,' answered she. "'I never fell before. I wish I could learn. Do you think I am the only person in my father's kingdom that can't fall?' Here the poor princess looked almost sad. "'I shall be most happy to fall in with you any time you like,' said the prince devotedly. "'Thank you. I don't know. Perhaps it would not be proper. But I don't care. At all events, as we've fallen in, let's have a swim together.' "'With all my heart,' responded the prince. And away they went, swimming and diving and floating until at last they heard cries along the shore and saw lights glancing in all directions it was now quite late and there was no moon mm, i must go home said the princess i am very sorry for this is delightful so am i returned the prince but i am glad i haven't a home to go to at least i don't exactly know where it is i wish i hadn't one either rejoined the princess it is so stupid I have a great mind, she continued, to play them all a trick. Why couldn't they leave me alone? They won't trust me in the lake for a single night. You see where that green light is burning? That is the window of my room. Now, if you would just swim there with me very quietly, and when we are all but under the balcony, give me such a push up, you call it, as you did a little while ago, I should be able to catch hold of the balcony and get in at the window and then they may look for me till to-morrow morning with more obedience than pleasure said the prince gallantly and away they swam very gently will you be in the lake to-morrow night the prince ventured to ask oh, to be sure i will i don't think so perhaps was the princess's somewhat strange answer but the prince was intelligent enough not to press her further and merely whispered as he gave her the parting lift don't tell the only answer the princess returned was a roguish look. She was already a yard above his head. The look seemed to say, Never fear, it's too good fun to spoil that way. So perfectly like other people had she been in the water, that even yet the prince could scarcely believe his eyes when he saw her ascend slowly, grasp the balcony, and disappear through the window. He turned, almost expecting to see her still by his side but he was alone in the water. So he swam away quietly, and watched the lights roving about the shore for hours after the princess was safe in her chamber. As soon as they disappeared, he landed in search of his tunic and sword, and after some trouble found them again. Then he made the best of his way round the lake to the other side. There the wood was wilder, and the shore steeper, rising more immediately towards the mountains which surrounded the lake on all sides, and kept sending it messages of silvery streams from morning to night, and all night long. He soon found a spot whence he could see the green light of the princess's room, and where, even in the broad daylight, he would be in no danger of being discovered from the opposite shore. It was a sort of cave in the rock, where he provided himself with a bed of withered leaves, and lay down too tired for hunger to keep him awake. All night long he dreamed that he was swimming with the princess. End of Part Two of The Light Princess Part Three of The Light Princess from the Light Princess and Other Fairy Tales by George MacDonald. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Clive Catterall. Part three of The Light Princess 
from the light princess and other fairy tales by george macdonald chapter 10 look at the moon early the next morning the prince set out to look for something to eat which he soon found at a forester's hut where for many following days he was supplied with all that a brave prince could consider necessary and having plenty to keep him alive for the present he would not think of wants not yet in existence whenever care intruded this prince always bowed him out in the most princely manner when he returned from his breakfast to his watch cave he saw the princess was already floating about in the lake attended by the king or queen whom he knew by their crowns and a great company in lovely little boats with canopies of all the colours of the rainbow and flags and streamers of a great many more it was a very bright day and soon the prince burned up with the heat began to long for the cold water and the cool princess but he had to endure till twilight for the boats had provisions on board and it was not till the sun went down that the gay party began to vanish boat after boat drew away to the shore following that of the king and queen till only one apparently the princess's own boat remained but she did not want to go home even yet and the prince thought he saw her order the boat to the shore without her at all events it rowed away and now of all the radiant company only one white speck remained then the prince began to sing and this is what he sang lady fair swan white lift thine eyes banish night by the might of thine eyes snowy arms oars of snow o'er her hither plashing low soft and slow o'er her hither stream behind her o'er the lake radiant whiteness in her wake following following for her sake radiant whiteness cling about her waters blue part not from her but renew cold and true kisses round her lap me round waters sad that have left her make me glad for ye had kissed her ere ye left her before he had finished his song the princess was just under the place where he sat and looking up to find him her ears had led her truly would you like a fall princess said the prince looking down ah there you are yes if you please prince said the princess looking up how do you know i'm a prince princess said the prince because you were a very nice young man prince said the princess come up then princess fetch me prince the prince took off his scarf then his sword belt then his tunic and tied them all together and let them down but the line was far too short he unwound his turban and added it to the rest when it was all but long enough and his purse completed it the princess just managed to lay hold of the knot of money and was beside him in a moment this rock was much higher than the other and the splash and the dive were tremendous the princess was in ecstasies of delight and their swim was delicious night after night they met and swam about in the dark clear lake where such was the prince's gladness that whether the princess's way of looking at things infected him or he was actually getting light-headed he often fancied that he was swimming in the sky instead of the lake but when he talked about being in heaven the princess laughed at him dreadfully when the moon came she brought them fresh pleasure everything looked strange and new in her light with an old withered yet unfading newness when the moon was nearly full one of their great delights was to dive deep in the water and then turning round look up through it at the great blot of light close above them shimmering and trembling and wavering spreading and contracting seeming to melt away and again grow solid then they would shoot up through the blot and lo there was the moon far off clear and steady and cold and very lovely at the bottom of a deeper and bluer lake than theirs as the princess said 
the prince soon found out that while in the water the princess was very like other people and besides this she was not so forward in her questions or pert in her replies at sea as on shore neither did she laugh so much and when she did laugh it was more gently she seemed altogether more modest and maidenly in the water than out of it but when the prince who had really fallen in love when he fell in the lake began to talk to her about love she always turned her head towards him and laughed after a while she began to look puzzled as if she were trying to understand what he meant but could not revealing a notion that he might mean something but as soon as ever she left the lake she was so altered that the prince said to himself if i marry her i see no help for it we must turn merman and mermaid and go out to sea at once chapter eleven hiss the princess's pleasure in the lake had grown to a passion and she could scarcely bear to be out of it for an hour imagine then her consternation when diving with the prince one night a sudden suspicion seized her that the lake was not so deep as it used to be the prince could not imagine what had happened she shot to the surface and without a word swam at full speed towards the higher side of the lake he followed begging to know if she was ill or what was the matter she never turned her head or took the smallest notice of his question arrived at the shore she coasted the rocks with minute inspection but she was not able to come to a conclusion for the moon was very small and so she could not see well she turned therefore and swam home without saying a word to explain her conduct to the prince of whose presence she seemed no longer conscious he withdrew to his cave in great perplexity and distress next day she made many observations which alas strengthened her fears she saw that the banks were too dry and that the grass on the shore and the trailing plants on the rocks were withering away she caused marks to be made along the borders and examined them day after day in all directions of the wind till at last the horrible idea became a certain fact that the surface of the lake was slowly sinking the poor princess nearly went out of the little mind she had it was awful to her to see the lake which she loved more than any living thing lie dying before her eyes it sank away slowly vanishing the tops of rocks that had never been seen till now began to appear far down in the clear water before long they were dry in the sun it was fearful to think of the mud that would soon lie there baking and festering full of lovely creatures dying and ugly creatures coming to life like the unmaking of a world and how hot the sun would be without any lake she could not bear to swim in it any more and began to pine away her life seemed bound up with it and ever as the lake sank she pined people said she would not live an hour after the lake was gone but she never cried proclamation was made to all the kingdom that whosoever should discover the cause of the lake's decrease would be rewarded after a princely fashion humdrum and copy cake applied themselves to their physics and metaphysics but in vain not even they could suggest a cause now the fact was that the old princess was at the root of the mischief when she heard that her niece found more pleasure in the water than anyone else out of it she went into a rage and cursed herself for her want of foresight but said she i will soon set all right the king and the people shall die of thirst their brains shall boil and frizzle in their skulls before i lose my revenge and she laughed a ferocious laugh that made the hairs on the back of her black cat stand erect with terror then she went to an old chest in the room and opening it took out what looked like a piece of dried seaweed this she threw into a tub of water then she threw some powder into the water 
and stirred it with her bare arm, muttering over it words of hideous sound and yet more hideous import. Then she set the tub aside, and took from the chest a huge bunch of rusty keys that clattered in her shaking hands. Then she sat down and proceeded to oil them all. Before she had finished, out from the tub, the water of which had kept on a slow motion ever since she had ceased stirring it, came the head and half the body of a huge grey snake. But the witch did not look round. It grew out of the tub, waving itself backwards and forwards with a slow horizontal motion, till it reached the princess. When it laid its head upon her shoulder and gave a low hiss in her ear, she started, but with joy, and seeing the head resting on her shoulder, drew it towards her and kissed it. Then she drew it all out of the tub, and wound it round her body. It was one of those dreadful creatures which few have ever beheld, the white snakes of darkness. Then she took the keys, and went down to her cellar, and as she unlocked the door she said to herself, This is worth living for. Locking the door behind her, she descended a few steps into the cellar, and crossing it, unlocked another door into a dark, narrow passage. She locked this also behind her, and descended a few more steps. If any one had followed the witch princess, he would have heard her unlock exactly one hundred doors, and descend a few steps after unlocking each. When she had unlocked the last, she entered a vast cave, the roof of which was supported by huge natural pillars of rock. Now this roof was the underside of the bottom of the lake. Then she untwined the snake from her body, and held it by the tail high above her. The hideous creature stretched up its head towards the roof of the cavern, which it was just able to reach, and it began to move its head backwards and forwards with a slow oscillating motion, as if looking for something. At the same moment the witch began to walk round and round the cavern, coming nearer to the centre every circuit, while the head of the snake described the same path over the roof that she did over the floor, for she kept holding it up, and still it kept slowly oscillating. Round and round the cavern they went, ever lessening the circuit, till at last the snake made a sudden dart and clung to the roof with its mouth. "'That's right, my beauty,' cried the princess. "'Drain it dry!' She let it go, left it hanging, and sat down on a great stone with her black cat, which had followed her all round the cave by her side. Then she began to knit and mutter awful words. The snake hung like a huge leech, sucking at the stone. The cat stood with his back arched, and his tail like a piece of cable, looking up at the snake, and the old woman sat and knitted and muttered. Seven days and seven nights they remained thus, when suddenly the serpent dropped from the roof as if exhausted, and shriveled up till it was again like a piece of dried seaweed. The witch started to her feet, picked it up, put it in her pocket, and looked up at the roof. One drop of water was trembling on the spot where the snake had been sucking. As soon as she saw that, she turned and fled, followed by her cat. Shutting the door in a terrible hurry, she locked it, and having muttered some frightful words, sped to the next, which also she locked and muttered over, and so with all the hundred doors till she arrived in her own cellar. There she sat down on the floor, ready to faint, but listening with malicious delight to the rushing of the water, which she could hear distinctly through all the hundred doors. But this was not enough. Now that she had tasted revenge, she lost her patience. Without further measures the lake would be too long in disappearing. So, the next night, with the last shred of the dying old moon rising, she took some of the water in which she had revived the snake, put it in a bottle, and set out, accompanied by her cat. 
Before morning she had made the entire circuit of the lake, muttering fearful words as she crossed every stream, and casting into it some of the water out of her bottle. When she had finished the circuit, she muttered yet again, and flung a handful of water towards the moon. Thereupon every spring in the country ceased to throb and bubble, dying away like the pulse of a dying man. The next day there was no sound of falling water to be heard along the borders of the lake. The very courses were dry, and the mountains showed no silvery streaks down their dark sides. And not alone had the fountains of Mother Earth ceased to flow, for all the babies throughout the country were crying dreadfully, only without tears. CHAPTER Twelve, WHERE IS THE PRINCE? Never since the night when the princess left him so abruptly had the prince had a single interview with her. He had seen her once or twice in the lake, but as far as he could discover she had not been in it any more at night. He had sat and sung and looked in vain for his naiad, while she, like a true naiad, was wasting away with her lake, sinking as it sank, withering as it dried. When at length he discovered the change that was taking place in the level of the water, he was in great alarm and perplexity. He could not tell whether the lake was dying because the lady had forsaken it, or whether the lady would not come because the lake had begun to sink. But he resolved to know so much at least. He disguised himself, and going to the palace, requested to see the Lord Chamberlain. His appearance at once gained his request and the Lord Chamberlain, being a man of some insight, perceived that there was more in the Prince's solicitation than met the ear. He felt likewise that no one could tell whence a solution to the present difficulties might arise, so he granted the Prince's prayer to be made shoe-black to the Princess. It was rather cunning in the Prince to request such an easy post, for the Princess could not possibly soil as many shoes as other Princesses. He soon learned all that could be learned about the princess. He went nearly distracted, but after roaming about the lake for days, and diving in every depth that remained, all that he could do was to put an extra polish on the dainty pair of shoes that was never called for. For the princess kept her room, with the curtains drawn to shut out the dying lake. But she could not shut it out of her mind for a moment. It haunted her imagination, so that she felt as if the lake were her soul, drying up within her, first to mud, then to madness and death. She thus brooded over the change, with all its dreadful accompaniments, till she was nearly distracted. As for the prince, she had forgotten him. However much she had enjoyed his company in the water, she did not care for him without it but she seemed to have forgotten her father and mother too. The lake went on sinking. Small slimy spots began to appear which glittered steadily amidst the changeful shine of the water. These grew to broad patches of mud, which widened and spread, with rocks here and there, and floundering fishes and crawling eels swarming. The people went everywhere catching these, and looking for anything that might have dropped from the royal boats. At length the lake was all but gone, only a few of the deepest pools remaining unexhausted. It happened one day that a party of youngsters found themselves on the brink of one of those pools, in the very centre of the lake. It was a rocky basin of considerable depth. Looking in, they saw at the bottom something that shone yellow in the sun. A little boy jumped in and dived for it. It was a plate of gold covered with writing. They carried it to the king. On one side of it stood these words, Death alone from death can save. Love is death, and so is brave. Love can fill the deepest grave. Love loves on beneath the wave. Now, this was enigmatical enough to the king and courtiers, but the reverse of the plate explained it a little. Its writing amounted to this. If the lake should disappear, they must find the hole through which the water ran, but it would be useless to try to stop it by any ordinary means. There was but one effectual mode. 
the body of a living man alone could staunch the flow. The man must give himself of his own will, and the lake must take his life as it filled, otherwise the offering would be of no avail. If the nation could not provide one hero it was time it should perish. CHAPTER Thirteen. HERE I AM. This was a very disheartening revelation to the king, not that he was unwilling to sacrifice a subject, but that he was hopeless of finding a man willing to sacrifice himself. No time was to be lost, however, for the princess was lying motionless on her bed, and taking no nourishment but lake water, which was, now, none of the best. Therefore the king caused the contents of the wonderful plate of gold to be published throughout the country. No one, however, came forward. The prince, having gone several days' journey into the forest to consult a hermit whom he had met there on his way to Lagerbell, knew nothing of the oracle till his return. When he had acquainted himself with all the particulars, he sat down and thought, "'She will die if I don't do it, and life would be nothing to me without her, so I shall lose nothing by doing it and life will be as pleasant to her as ever, for she will soon forget me, and there will be so much more beauty and happiness in the world. To be sure, I shall not see it. Here the poor prince gave a sigh. How lovely the lake will be in the moonlight, with that glorious creature sporting in it like a wild goddess. It is rather hard to be drowned by inches, though. Let me see. That will be seventy inches of me to drown. Here he tried to laugh, but could not. The longer the better. However, he resumed, for can I not bargain that the princess shall be beside me all the time? So I shall see her once more, kiss her, perhaps, who knows, and die looking in her eyes. It will be no death. At least I shall not feel it. And to see the lake filling for the beauty again. All right, I'm ready. He kissed the princess's boot, laid it down, and hurried to the king's apartment. But, feeling, as he went, that anything sentimental would be disagreeable, he resolved to carry off the whole affair with nonchalance. So he knocked at the door of the king's counting-house, where it was all but a capital crime to disturb him. When the king heard the knock he started up, and opened the door in a rage. Seeing only the shoe-black he drew his sword. This, I am sorry to say, was his usual mode of asserting his regality when he thought his dignity was in danger. But the prince was not in the least alarmed. "'Please, Your Majesty, I'm your butler,' said he. "'My butler? You lying rascal! What do you mean? I, I mean, I will cork your big bottle.' "'Is the fellow mad?' bawled the king, raising the point of his sword. "'I will put a stopper—a a plug, what do you call it—in your leaky lake, Grand Monarch,' said the prince." The king was in such a rage that before he could speak he had time to cool, and to reflect that it would be a great waste to kill the only man who was willing to be useful in the present emergency, seeing that in the end the insolent fellow would be as dead as if he had died by his majesty's own hand. Uh, "'Oh!' said he at last, putting up his sword with difficulty. It was so long. "'I'm obliged to you, young fool. Take a glass of wine?' "'No, thank you,' replied the prince. "'Very well,' said the king. "'Would you like to run and see your parents before you make your experiment?' "'No, thank you,' said the prince. "'Then we will go and look for the hole at once,' said His Majesty, and proceeded to call some attendants. "'Stop! Please, Your Majesty, I have a condition to make,' interposed the prince. "'What?' exclaimed the king. "'A condition? And with me? How dare you!' "'As you please,' returned the prince coolly. I wish your majesty a good morning. You wretch! I will have you put in a sack and stuck in the hole." "'Very well, your majesty,' replied the prince, becoming a little more respectful, lest the wrath of the king should deprive him of the pleasure of dying for the princess. But what good will that do your majesty? Please to remember that the oracle says the victim must offer himself." "'Well, you have offered yourself,' retorted the king. "'Yes, upon one condition. "'Condition again!' roared the king, once more drawing his sword. "'Begone! Somebody else will be glad enough to take the honour off your shoulders. 
"'Your Majesty knows it will not be easy to get another to take my place.' "'Well, what is your condition?' growled the King, feeling that the Prince was right. "'Only this,' replied the Prince, "'that, as I must on no account die before I am fairly drowned, and the waiting will be rather wearisome, the Princess, your daughter, shall go with me, feed me with her own hands, and look at me now and then, to comfort me. For you must confess it is rather hard. As soon as the water is up to my eyes, she may go and be happy, and forget her poor Shublak. Here the Prince's voice faltered, and he very nearly grew sentimental, in spite of his resolution. "'Why didn't you tell me before what your condition was? Such a fuss about nothing!' exclaimed the King. "'Do you grant it?' persisted the Prince. "'Yes, of course I do,' replied the King. "'Very well. I am ready. Go and have some dinner, then, while I set my people to find the place.' The King ordered out his guards, and gave directions to the officers to find the hole in the lake at once. So the bed of the lake was marked out in divisions, and thoroughly examined, and in an hour or so the hole was discovered. It was in the middle of a stone, near the centre of the lake in the very pool where the golden plate had been found. It was a three-cornered hole of no great size. There was water all round the stone, but very little was flowing through the hole. End of Part 3 of The Light Princess Part 4 of The Light Princess from the Light Princess and Other Fairy Tales by George MacDonald. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Clive Catterall. Part four of The Light Princess from the Light Princess and Other Fairy Tales by George MacDonald. CHAPTER Fourteen. This is very kind of you. The prince went to dress for the occasion, for he was resolved to die like a prince. When the princess heard that a man had offered to die for her, she was so transported that she jumped off the bed, feeble as she was, and danced about the room for joy. She did not care who the man was, that was nothing to her. The hole wanted stopping, and if only a man would do, why, take one. In an hour or two more everything was ready. Her maid dressed her in haste, and they carried her to the side of the lake. When she saw it, she shrieked and covered her face with her hands. They bore her across to the stone, where they had already placed a little boat for her. The water was not deep enough to float it, but they hoped it would be before long. They laid her on cushions, placed in the boat wines and fruits and other nice things and stretched a canopy over all. In a few minutes the prince appeared. The princess recognized him at once, but did not think it worth while to acknowledge him. "'Here I am,' said the prince. "'Put me in.' "'They told me it was a shoe-black,' said the princess. "'So I am,' said the prince. "'I blacked your little boots three times a day, because they were all I could get of you. Put me in.' The courtiers did not resent his bluntness, except by saying to each other that he was taking it out in impudence. But how was he to be put in? The golden plate contained no instructions on this point. The prince looked at the hole and saw but one way. He put both his legs into it, sitting on the stone, and, stooping forward, covered the corner that remained open with his two hands. In this uncomfortable position he resolved to abide his fate, and turning to the people said, "'Now you can go.' The king had already gone home to dinner. "'Now you can go,' repeated the princess after him, like a parrot. The people obeyed her and went. Presently a little wave flowed over the stone and wetted one of the prince's knees. But he did not mind it much. He began to sing and the song he sung was this. As a world that has no well, darkly bright in forest dell, as a world without the gleam of a downward-going stream, 
as a world without the glance of the ocean's fair expanse, as a world where never rain glittered on the sunny plain, such, my heart, thy world would be, if no love did flow in thee. As a world without the sound of the rivulets underground, or the bubbling of the spring out of darkness wandering, or the mighty rush and flowing of the rivers downward going, or the music showers that drop on the outspread beach's top, or the ocean's mighty voice when his lifted waves rejoice, such, my soul, thy world would be, if no love did sing in thee. Lady, keep thy world's delight, keep the waters in thy sight. Love hath made me strong to go, for thy sake to realms below, where the waters shine and hum through the darkness never come. Let, I pray, one thought of me spring a little well in thee, lest thy loveless soul be found like a dry and thirsty ground. Sing again, prince, it makes it less tedious, said the princess. But the prince was too much overcome to sing any more, and a long pause followed. Ah, this is very kind of you, prince, said the princess at last, quite coolly, as she lay in the boat with her eyes shut. I'm sorry I can't return the compliment, thought the prince, but you are worth dying for, after all. Again a wavelet, and another, and another flowed over the stone, and wetted both the prince's knees, but he did not speak or move. Two, three, four hours passed in this way, the princess apparently asleep, and the prince very patient. But he was much disappointed in his position for he had none of the consolation he had hoped for. At last he could bear it no longer. "'Princess!' said he. But at the moment up started the princess, crying, "'I'm afloat! I'm afloat!' And the little boat bumped against the stone. "'Princess!' repeated the prince, encouraged by seeing her wide awake and looking eagerly at the water. "'Well,' said she, without looking round, "'your papa promised that you should look at me, and you haven't looked at me once.' "'Did he? Then I suppose I must. But I'm so sleepy.' "'Sleep then, darling, and don't mind me,' said the poor prince. "'Really, you are very good,' replied the princess. "'I think I will go to sleep again.' "'Just give me a glass of wine and a biscuit first, said the prince very humbly. "'With all my heart,' said the princess, and gaped as she said it. She got the wine and the biscuit, however, and leaning over the side of the boat towards him, was compelled to look at him. "'Why, Prince,' she said, "'you don't look well. Are you sure you don't mind it?' "'Not a bit,' answered he, feeling very faint indeed. "'Only I shall die before it is of any use to you, unless I have something to eat.' "'There, then,' said she, holding out the wine to him. "'Ah, uh, you must feed me. I dare not move my hands. The water would run away directly.' "'Good gracious!' said the princess, and she began at once to feed him with bits of biscuit and sips of wine. As she fed him, he contrived to kiss the tips of her fingers now and then. She did not seem to mind it one way or the other, but the prince felt better. "'Now, for your own sake, princess,' said he, "'I cannot let you go to sleep. You must sit and look at me, else I shall not be able to keep up. "'Well, I will do anything I can to oblige you,' said she, with condescension. And sitting down, she did look at him, and kept looking at him with wonderful steadiness, considering all things. The sun went down, and the moon rose, and gush after gush the waters were rising up the prince's body. They were up to his waist now. Oh, "'Why can't we go and have a swim?' said the princess. "'There seems to be water enough just about here.' "'I shall never swim more,' said the prince. "'Oh, mm, I forgot,' said the princess, and was silent. So the water grew and grew, and rose up and up on the prince. And the princess sat and looked at him. She fed him now and then. The night wore on. The waters rose and rose. The moon rose likewise higher and higher and shone full on the face of the dying prince. The water 
was up to his neck. "'Will you kiss me, princess?' said he, feebly. The nonchalance was all gone now. "'Yes, I will,' answered the princess, and kissed him with a long, sweet, cold kiss. "'Now,' said he, with a sigh of content, "'I die happy.' He did not speak again. The princess gave him some wine for the last time. He was past eating. Then she sat down again and looked at him. The water rose and rose. It touched his chin. It touched his lower lip. It touched between his lips. He shut them hard to keep it out. The princess began to feel strange. It touched his upper lip. He breathed through his nostrils. The princess looked wild. It covered his nostrils. Her eyes looked scared and shone strange in the moonlight. His head fell back. The water closed over it, and the bubbles of his last breath bubbled up through the water. The princess gave a shriek and sprang into the lake. She laid hold first of one leg, and then of the other, and pulled and tugged, but she could not move either. She stopped to take a breath, and that made her think that he could not get any breath. She was frantic. She got hold of him and held his head above the water, which was possible now his hands were no longer on the hole. But it was of no use, for he was past breathing. Love and water brought back all her strength. She got under the water, and pulled and pulled with her whole might, till at last she got one leg out. The other easily followed. How she got him into the boat she never could tell, but when she did she fainted away. Coming to herself, she seized the oars, kept herself steady as best she could, and rowed and rowed, though she had never rowed before. Round rocks and over shallows and through mud she rowed, till she got to the landing-stairs of the palace. By this time her people were on the shore, for they had heard her shriek. She made them carry the prince to her own room, and lay him in her bed, and light a fire, and send for the doctors. "'But the lake, your highness,' said the chamberlain who, roused by the noise, came in in his nightcap. "'Go drown yourself in it,' she said. This was the last rudeness of which the princess was ever guilty, and one must allow that she had good cause to feel provoked with the Lord Chamberlain. Had it been the king himself he would have fared no better, but both he and the queen were fast asleep, and the chamberlain went back to his bed. Somehow the doctors never came. So the princess and her old nurse were left with the prince. But the old nurse was a wise woman and knew what to do. They tried everything for a long time without success. The princess was nearly distracted between hope and fear, but she tried on and on, one thing after another, and everything over and over again. At last, when they had all but given up, just as the sun rose, the prince opened his eyes. CHAPTER Fifteen. LOOK AT THE RAIN! The princess burst into a passion of tears and fell on the floor. There she lay for an hour, and her tears never ceased. All the pent-up crying of her life was spent now. And a rain came on, such as had never been seen in that country. The sun shone all the time, and the great drops which fell straight to the earth shone likewise. The palace was in the heart of a rainbow. It was a rain of rubies and sapphires and emeralds and topazes. The torrents poured from the mountains like molten gold, and if it had not been for its subterraneous outlet, the lake would have overflowed and inundated the country. It was full from shore to shore. But the princess did not heed the lake. She lay on the floor and wept and this rain within doors was far more wonderful than the rain out of doors. For when it abated a little, and she proceeded to rise, she found, to her astonishment, that she could not. At length, after many efforts, she succeeded in getting upon her feet. But she tumbled down again directly. Hearing her fall, her old nurse uttered a yell of delight, and ran to her, screaming, "'My darling child, she's found her gravity!' "'Oh, that's it, is it?' said the princess, rubbing her shoulder and her knee alternately. "'I consider it very unpleasant. 
I feel as if I should be crushed to pieces. Hurrah! cried the prince from the bed. If you've come round, princess, so have I. How's the lake? Brim full, answered the nurse. Then we're all happy. That we are indeed, answered the princess, sobbing. And there was rejoicing all over the country that rainy day. Even the babies forgot their past troubles, and danced and crowed amazingly. And the king told stories, and the queen listened to them. And he divided the money in his box, and she the honey in her pot, to all the children. And there was such jubilation as was never heard of before. Of course the prince and princess were betrothed at once. But the princess had to learn to walk before they could be married with any propriety. And this was not so easy at her time of life, for she could walk no more than a baby. She was always falling down and hurting herself. "'Is this the gravity you used to make so much of?' said she one day to the prince, as he raised her from the floor. "'For my part I was a great deal more comfortable without it.' "'No, no, that's not it. This is it,' replied the prince, as he took her up and carried her about like a baby, kissing her all the time. "'This is gravity.' Mm, "'That's much better,' said she. "'I don't mind that so much.' And she smiled the sweetest, loveliest smile in the prince's face. And she gave him one little kiss in return for all his, and he thought them overpaid, for he was beside himself with delight. I fear she complained of her gravity more than once after this, notwithstanding. It was a long time before she got reconciled to walking. But the pain of learning it was quite counterbalanced by two things, either of which would have been sufficient consolation. The first was that the prince himself was her teacher, and the second that she could tumble into the lake as often as she pleased. Still, she preferred to have the prince jump in with her, and the splash they made before was nothing to the splash they made now. The lake never sank again. In the process of time it wore the roof of the cavern quite through, and was twice as deep as before. The only revenge the princess took upon her aunt was to tread pretty hard on her gouty toe the next time she saw her. But she was sorry for it the very next day, when she heard that the water had undermined her house, and that it had fallen in the night, burying her in its ruins, whence no one ever ventured to dig up her body. And there she lies to this day. So, the prince and princess lived and were happy, and had crowns of gold, and clothes of cloth, and shoes of leather, and children of boys and girls, not one of whom was ever known, on the most critical occasion, to lose the smallest atom of his or her due proportion of gravity. End of the Light Princess Part One of the Giant's Heart, from the Light Princess and Other Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Clive Catterall. Part One of the Giant's Heart, from the Light Princess and Other Fairy Tales, by George MacDonald. There was once a giant who lived on the borders of giant land where it touched on the country of common people. Everything in giant land was so big that the common people saw only a mass of awful mountains and clouds, and no living man had ever come from it, as far as anybody knew, to tell what he had seen in it. Somewhere near these borders, on the other side, by the edge of a great forest, lived a labourer with his wife and a great many children. One day Trixie Wee, as they called her, teased her brother Buffy Bob till he could not bear it any longer, and gave her a box on the ear. Trixie Wee cried, and Buffy Bob was so sorry, and so ashamed of himself, that he cried too, and ran off into the wood. He was so long gone that Trixie Wee began to be frightened, for she was very fond of her brother and she was so distressed that she had first teased him and then cried, that at last she ran into the wood to look for him, 
though there was more chance of losing herself than of finding him. And so, indeed, it seemed likely to turn out, for running on without looking, she at length found herself in a valley she knew nothing about. And no wonder, for what she thought was a valley with round rocky sides was no other than the space between two of the roots of a great tree that grew on the borders of giant land. She climbed over the side of it, and went towards what she took for a black, round-topped mountain far away, but which she soon discovered to be close to her, and to be a hollow place so great that she could not tell what it was hollowed out of. Staring at it she found that it was a doorway, and going nearer, and staring harder, she saw the door, far in, with a knocker of iron upon it, a great many yards above her head, and as large as the anchor of a big ship. Now, nobody had ever been unkind to Trixie Wee, and therefore she was not afraid of anybody. For Buffy Bob's box on the ear she did not think worth considering. So, spying a little hole at the bottom of the door, which had been nibbled by some giant mouse, she crept through it, and found herself in an enormous hall. She could not have seen the other end of it at all, except for the great fire that was burning there, diminished to a spark in the distance. Towards this fire she ran as fast as she could, and was not far from it, when something fell before her with a great clatter, over which she tumbled and went rolling on the floor. She was not much hurt, however, and got up in a moment. Then she saw that what she had fallen over was not unlike a great iron bucket. When she examined it more closely, she discovered that it was a thimble, and looking up to see who had dropped it, beheld a huge face with spectacles as big as the round windows of a church bending over her, and looking everywhere for the thimble. Trixie Wee immediately laid hold of it with both her arms, and lifted it about an inch nearer to the nose of the peering giantess. This movement made the old lady see where it was, and her finger popping into it, it vanished from the eyes of Trixie Wee, buried in the folds of a white stocking like a cloud in the sky, which Mrs. Giant was busy darning. For it was Saturday night, and a husband would wear nothing but white stockings on Sunday. To be sure, he did eat little children, but only very little ones, and if it ever crossed his mind that it was wrong to do so, he always said to himself, that he wore whiter stockings on Sunday than any other giant in all giant land. At the same instant, Trixie Wee heard a sound like the wind in a tree full of leaves, and could not think what it could be, till, looking up, she found that it was the giantess whispering to her, and when she tried very hard she could hear what she said well enough. "'Run away, dear little girl,' she said, "'as fast as you can, for my husband will be home in a few minutes.' "'But I have never been naughty to your husband,' said Trixie Wee, looking up into the giantess's face. "'That doesn't matter. You had better go. He is fond of little children, particularly little girls. "'Oh, then he won't hurt me.' "'I am not sure of that. He is so fond of them that he eats them up, "'and I am afraid he couldn't help hurting you a little. He is a very good man, though.' "'Oh, then,' um, began Trixie Wee, feeling rather frightened. But before she could finish her sentence, she heard the sound of footsteps, very far apart and very heavy. The next moment, who should come running towards her, full speed and as pale as death, but Buffy Bob? She held out her arms, and he ran into them, but when she tried to kiss him, she only kissed the back of his head, for his white face and round eyes were turned to the door. "'Run, children, run and hide,' said the giantess. "'Come, Buffy,' said Trixie, "'yonder's a great break.' We'll hide in it. The break was a big broom, and they had just got into the bristles of it, when they heard the door open with a sound of thunder, and in stalked the giant. You would have thought you saw the whole earth through the door when he opened it. So wide was it, and when he closed it, it was like nightfall. Where is that little boy? he cried, with a voice like the bellowing of a cannon. He looked a very nice boy indeed. I am almost sure he crept through the mouse hole at the bottom of the door. Where is he, my dear? I don't know, answered the giantess. But you know it is wicked to tell lies, don't you, my dear? retorted the giant. 
"'Now, you ridiculous old thunderthump,' said his wife, with a smile as broad as the sea in the sun. "'How can I mend your white stockings and look after little boys? You have got plenty to last you over Sunday, I'm sure. Just look what good little boys they are.' Trixie Wee and Buffy Bob peered through the bristles and discovered a row of little boys, about a dozen, with very fat faces and goggle eyes, sitting before the fire and looking stupidly into it. Thunderthump intended the most of these for pickling, and was feeding them well before salting them. Now and then, however, he could not keep his teeth off them, and would eat one by the by, without salt. He strode up to the wretched children. Now, what made them very wretched indeed was that they knew if they could only keep from eating and grow thin, the giant would dislike them and turn them out to find their way home. But notwithstanding this, so greedy were they that they ate as much as ever they could hold. The giantess, who fed them, comforted herself with thinking that they were not real boys and girls, but only little pigs pretending to be boys and girls. "'Now tell me the truth,' cried the giant, bending his face down over them. They shook with terror, and every one hoped it was somebody else the giant liked best. "'Where is the little boy that ran into the hall just now? Whoever tells me a lie shall be instantly boiled.' He, "'He's in the broom,' cried one dough-faced boy. "'He's in there, and a little girl with him.' "'The naughty children,' cried the giant, "'to hide from me.' and he made a stride towards the broom. "'Catch hold of the bristles, Bobby. Get right into a tuft and hold on,' cried Trixie Wee, just in time. The giant caught up the broom, and seeing nothing under it, set it down again with a force that threw them both on the floor. He then made two strides to the boys, caught the dough-faced one by the neck, and took the lid off a great pot that was boiling on the fire, popped him in as if he had been a trussed chicken, and put the lid on again, saying, "'There, boys, see what comes of lying?' Asked no more questions, for, as he always kept his word, he was afraid he might have to do the same to them all. And he did not like boiled boys. He liked to eat them crisp, as radishes, whether forked or not, ought to be eaten. He then sat down and asked his wife if his supper was ready. She looked into the pot, and throwing the boy out with the ladle, as if he had been a black beetle that had tumbled in, and had the worst of it, answered that she thought it was. Whereupon he rose to help her, and taking the pot from the fire, poured the whole contents, bubbling and splashing, into a dish like a vat. Then they sat down to supper. The children in the broom could not see what they had, but it seemed to agree with them, for the giant talked like thunder, and the giantess answered like the sea, and they grew chattier and chattier. At length, the giant said, "'I don't feel quite comfortable about that heart of mine.' And as he spoke, instead of laying his hand upon his bosom, he waved it away towards the corner where the children were peeping from the broom bristles like frightened little mice. "'Well, you know, my darling Thunderthump,' answered his wife, "'I always thought it ought to be nearer home. But you know best, of course.' "'Ha! ha! You don't know where it is, wife. I moved it a month ago.' Oh, what a man you are, Thunder Thump! You trust any creature alive rather than your wife. Here the giantess gave a sob, which sounded exactly like a wave going flop into the mouth of a cave up to the roof. Where have you got it now? she resumed, checking her emotion. Well, Doodlem, I don't mind telling you, answered the giant soothingly. The great she eagle has got it for a nest egg. She sits on it night and day, and thinks she will bring the greatest eagle out of it that ever sharpened his beak on the rocks of Mount Skycrack. I can warrant no one else will touch it while she has got it. But she is rather capricious, and I confess I am not easy about it. For the least scratch of one of her claws would do for me at once, and she has claws. I refer any one who doubts this part of my story to certain chronicles of giant land preserved among the Celtic nations. It was quite a common thing for a giant to put his heart out to nurse, because he did not like the trouble and responsibility of doing it himself, although I must confess it was a dangerous sort of plan to take, especially with such a delicate viscous as the heart. 
All this time Buffy Bob and Trixie Wee were listening with long ears. Oh, thought Trixie Wee, if I could but find the giant's cruel heart, wouldn't I give it a squeeze? The giant and giantess went on talking for a long time. The giantess kept advising the giant to hide his heart somewhere in the house, but he seemed afraid of the advantage it would give her over him. "'You could hide it at the bottom of the flour-barrel,' said she. "'That would make me feel choky,' answered he. "'Well, in the coal-cellar, or in the dust-hole, that's the place. No one would think of looking for your heart in the dust-hole.' "'Worse and worse!' cried the giant. "'Will the water butt suggested she. "'No, no, it would grow spongy there,' said he. "'Well, what will you do with it?' I will leave it a month longer where it is, and then I will give it to the Queen of the Kangaroos, and she will carry it in her pouch for me. It is best to change its place, you know, lest my enemies should scent it out. But, dear Doodlem, it's a fretting care to have a heart of one's own to look after. The responsibility is too much for me. If it were not for a bite of a radish now and then, I could never bear it. Here the giant looked lovingly towards the row of little boys by the fire, all of whom were nodding or asleep on the floor. "'Why don't you trust it to me, dear Thunderthump?' said his wife. "'I would take the best possible care of it.' "'I don't doubt it, my love, but the responsibility would be too much for you. You would no longer be my darling, light-hearted, airy, laughing doodlem. It would transform you into a heavy, oppressed woman weary of life as I am. The giant closed his eyes and pretended to go to sleep. His wife got his stockings and went on with her darning. Soon the giant's pretense became reality and the giantess began to nod over her work. Now, Buffy, whispered Trixie Wee, now's our time. I think it's moonlight and we had better be off. There's a door with a hole for the cat just behind us. All right, said Buffy Bob, I'm ready. So they got out of the broom break and crept to the door. But to their great disappointment, when they got through it, they found themselves in a sort of shed. It was full of tubs and things, and though it was built of wood only, they could not find a crack. Let us try this hole, said Trixie, for the giant and giantess were sleeping behind them, and they dared not go back. All right, said Bob. He seldom said anything else than all right. Now this hole was in a mound that came in through the wall of the shed, and went along the floor for some distance. They crawled into it, and found it very dark. But groping their way along, they soon came to a small crack, through which they saw grass, pale in the moonshine. As they crept on, they found the hole began to get wider and lead upwards. "'What is that noise of rushing?' said Buffy Bob. "'I can't tell,' replied Trixie, "'for you see, I don't know what we're in.' The fact was they were creeping along a channel in the heart of a giant tree, and the noise they heard was the noise of the sap rushing along its wooden pipes. When they laid their ears to the wall, they heard it gurgling along with a pleasant noise. "'It sounds kind and good,' said Trixie. "'It is water running. Now it must be running from somewhere to somewhere. I think we had better go on, and we shall come somewhere.' It was now rather difficult to go on, for they had to climb as if they were climbing a hill, and now the passage was wide. Worn nearly out, they saw light overhead at last, and creeping through a crack into the open air, they found themselves in the fork of a huge tree. A great, broad, uneven space lay around them, out of which spread boughs in every direction, the smallest of them as big as the biggest tree in the country of common people. Overhead were leaves enough to supply all the trees they had ever seen. Not much moonlight could come through, but the leaves would glimmer white in the wind at times. The tree was full of giant birds. Every now and then one would sweep through with a great noise. 
but except an occasional chirp sounding like a shrill pipe in a great organ, they made no noise. All at once an owl began to hoot. He thought he was singing. As soon as he began, other birds replied, making rare game of him. To their astonishment the children found they could understand every word they sang. And what they sang was something like this. I will sing a song, I'm the owl. Sing a song, you sing-song, ugly fowl. What will you sing about, night in and day out? Sing about the night, I'm the owl. You could not see for the light, stupid fowl. Oh, the moon and the dew, and the shadows to woo. The owl spread out his silent, soft, sly wings, and lighting between Trixie Wee and Buffy Bob nearly smothered them, closing up one under each wing. It was like being buried in a down bed. But the owl did not like anything between his sides and his wings, so he opened his wings again, and the children made haste to get out. Trixie Wee immediately went in front of the bird, and looking up into his huge face, which was as round as the eyes of a giantess's spectacles, and much bigger, dropped a pretty curtsy and said, "'Please, Mr. Owl, I want to whisper to you.' "'Very well, small child,' answered the owl, looking important and stooping his ear towards her. "'What is it?' "'Please tell me where the eagle lives that sits on the giant's heart.' "'Oh, you naughty child! That's a secret for shame!' and with a great hiss that terrified them, the owl flew into the tree. All birds are fond of secrets, but not many of them can keep them so well as the owl. So the children went on, because they did not know what else to do. They found the way very rough and difficult. The tree was so full of humps and hollows. Now and then they plashed into a pool of rain. Now and then they came upon twigs growing out of the trunk, where they had no business, and they were as large as full-grown poplars. Sometimes they came upon great cushions of soft moss, and on one of them they lay down and rested. But they had not lain long before they spied a large nightingale sitting on a branch, with its bright eyes looking up at the moon. In a moment more he began to sing, and the birds about him began to reply, but in a different tone from that in which they had replied to the owl. Oh, the birds did call the nightingale such pretty names. The nightingale sang, and the birds replied like this. I will sing a song. I'm the nightingale. Sing a song long, long, little never fail. What will you sing about, light in or light out? Sing about the light gone away, down, away, and out of sight. Poor lost day, mourning for the day dead, o'er his dim bed. The nightingale sang so sweetly that the children would have fallen asleep, but for fear of losing any of the song. When the nightingale stopped, they got up and wandered on. They did not know where they were going, but they thought it best to keep going on, because then they might come upon something or other. They were very sorry they had forgotten to ask the nightingale about the eagle's nest, but his music had put everything else out of their heads. They resolved, however, not to forget the next time they had a chance. So they went on and on, till they were both tired, and Trixie Wee said at last, trying to laugh, I declare my legs feel just like a Dutch doll's. And here's the place to go to bed in, said Buffy Bob. They stood at the edge of a last year's nest, and looked down with delight into the round, mossy cave. Then they crept gently in, and lying down in each other's arms, found it so deep and warm and comfortable and soft, that they were soon fast asleep. End of Part One of The Giant's Heart Part Two of The Giant's Heart From The Light Princess and Other Fairy Tales by George MacDonald This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Clive Catterall. Part Two of the Giant's Heart, from the Light Princess and Other Fairy Tales by George MacDonald. Now, close beside them, in a hollow, was another nest, in which lay a lark and his wife. And the children were awakened very early in the morning by a dispute between Mr. and Mrs. Lark. "'Let me up,' said the lark. "'It is not time,' said the lark's wife. "'It is,' said the lark rather rudely. "'The darkness is quite thin. I can almost see my own beak.' "'Nonsense,' said the lark's wife. "'You know you came home yesterday morning quite worn out. You had to fly so very high before you saw him. I am sure he would not mind if you took it a little easier. Do be quiet and go to sleep again.' "'That's not it at all,' said the lark. "'He doesn't want me. I want him. Let me up, I say.' He began to sing, and Trixy Wee and Buffy Bob, having now learned the way, answered him. "'I will sing a song, I'm the lark. Sing, sing, throat strong, little kill the dark. Now what will you sing about? What will you sing about now the night is out? I can only call, I can't think. Let me up, that's all, let me drink. Thirsting all the long night for a drink of light.' By this time the lark was standing on the edge of his nest, and looking at the children. "'Poor little things, you can't fly,' said the lark. "'No, but we can look up,' said Trixie. "'Ah, you don't know what it is to see the very first of the sun. "'But we know what it is to wait till he comes. "'He's no worse for your seeing him first, is he?' "'Oh, no, certainly not,' answered the lark, with condescension, and then bursting into his jubilante. He sprang aloft, clapping his wings like a clock running down. "'Tell us where—' began Buffy Bob, but the lark was out of sight. His song was all that was left of him. That was everywhere, and he was nowhere. "'Selfish bird,' said Buffy. "'It's all very well for larks to go hunting the sun, but they have no business to despise their neighbours for all that.' "'Can I be of any use to you?' said a sweet bird voice out of the nest. This was the lark's wife, who stayed at home with the young larks while her husband went to church. "'Oh, thank you, if you please,' answered Trixie Wee. And up popped a pretty brown head, and then up came a brown feathery body, and last of all came the slender legs onto the edge of the nest. There she turned, and looking down into the nest, from which came a litany of chirpings for breakfast, said, "'Lie still, little ones.' Then she turned to the children. "'My husband is king of the larks,' she said. Buffy Bob took off his cap, and Trixie Wee curtsied very low. "'Oh, no, it's not me,' said the bird, looking very shy. "'I am only his wife. It's my husband.' And she looked up after him into the sky, whence his song was still falling like a shower of musical hailstones. Perhaps she could see him. "'He's a splendid bird,' said Buffy Bob. "'Only, you know, he will get up a little too early. Oh, no, he doesn't. It's only his way, you know. But tell me what I can do for you. Tell us, please, Lady Lark, where the she-eagle lives that sits on giant Thunderthump's heart. Oh, that is a secret. Did you promise not to tell? No, but larks ought to be discreet. They see more than other birds. But you don't fly up high like your husband, do you? Not often, but it's no matter. I come to know things for all that. Do tell me, and I will sing you a song, said Trixie Wee. Can you sing too? You've got no wings. Yes, and I will sing you a song I learned the other day about a lark and his wife. Please do, said the lark's wife. Be quiet, children, and listen. Trixie Wee was very glad she happened to know a song which would please the lark's wife at least whatever the lark himself might have thought of it, if he had heard it. So she sang. "'Good morrow, my lord, in the sky alone,' sang the lark, as the sun ascended his throne. "'Shine on me, lord, I only am come, of all your servants, to welcome you home. I have flown a whole hour right up, I swear, to catch the first shine of your golden hair.' "'Must I thank you, then,' said the king, "'Sir Lark, for flying so high and hating the dark.' You ask a full cup for half a thirst, 
half is love of me and half love to be first there's many a bird that makes no haste but waits till i come that's as much to my taste and the king hid his head in a turban of cloud and the lark stopped singing quite vexed and cowed but he flew up higher and thought anon the wrath of the king will be over and gone and his crown shining out of its cloudy fold will change my brown feathers to a glory of gold so he flew with the strength of a lark he flew but as he rose the cloud rose too and not a gleam of the golden hair came through the depth of the misty air till weary with flying with sighing sore the strong sun-seeker could do no more his wings had had no chrism of gold and his feathers felt withered and worn and old so he quivered and sank and dropped like a stone and there on his nest where he left her alone sat his little wife on her little eggs keeping them warm with wings and legs did i say alone ah no such thing full in her face was shining the king welcome sir lark you look tired said he up is not always the best way to me while you have been singing so high and away i have been shining to your little wife all day he had set his crown all about the nest and out of the midst shone her little brown breast and so glorious was she in russet gold that for wonder and awe sir lark grew cold he popped his head under her wing and lay as still as a stone till the king was away as soon as tricksy wee had finished her song the lark's wife began a low sweet modest little song of her own and after she had piped away for two or three minutes she said you dear children what can i do for you tell us where the she-eagle lives please said tricksy wee well i don't think there can be much harm in telling such wise good children said lady lark i'm sure you don't want to do any mischief oh no quite the contrary said buffy bob then i'll tell you she lives on the very topmost peak of mount skycrack and the only way to get up is to climb on the spider's webs that cover it from top to bottom that's rather serious said tricksy wee but you don't want to go up you foolish little thing you can't go and what do you want to go up for that is a secret said tricksy wee well it's no business of mine rejoined lady lark a little offended and quite vexed that she had told them so she flew away to find some breakfast for her little ones who by this time were chirping very impatiently the children looked at each other joined hands and walked off in a minute more the sun was up and they soon reached the outside of the tree the bark was so knobby and rough and full of twigs that they managed to get down though not without great difficulty then far away to the north they saw a huge peak like the spire of a church going right up into the sky they thought this must be mount skycrack and turned their faces towards it as they went on they saw a giant or two now and then striding about the fields or through the woods but they kept out of their way nor were they in much danger for it was only one or two of the border giants that were so very fond of children at last they came to the foot of mount skycrack it stood in a plain alone and shot right up i don't know how many thousand feet into the air a long narrow spear-like mountain the whole face of it from top to bottom was covered with a network of spiders webs with the threads of various sizes from that of silk to that of whipcord the webs shook and quivered and waved in the sun glittering like silver all about ran huge greedy spiders catching huge silly flies and devouring them here they sat down to consider what could be done the spiders did not heed them but ate away at the flies now at the foot of the mountain and all around it was a ring of water not very broad but very deep as they sat watching them one of the spiders whose web was woven across this water somehow or other lost his hold and fell in on his back tricksy wee and buffy bob ran to his assistance and laying hold each of one of his legs 
succeeded with the help of the other legs, which struggled spiderfully, in getting him out upon dry land. As soon as he had shaken himself and dried himself a little, the spider turned to the children, saying, "'And now, what can I do for you?' "'Tell us, please,' said they, "'how we can get up the mountain to the she-eagle's nest.' "'Nothing is easier,' answered the spider. "'Just run up there, and tell them all I sent you, and nobody will mind you.' "'But we haven't got claws like you, Mr. Spider,' said Buffy. Uh, "'No more you have, poor unprovided creatures. Still, I think we can manage it. Come home with me.' "'You won't eat us, will you?' said Buffy. "'My dear child,' answered the spider, in a tone of injured dignity, "'I eat nothing but what is mischievous or useless. "'You have helped me, and now I will help you.' "'The children rose at once, and climbing as well as they could, "'reached the spider's nest in the very centre of the web. "'Nor did they find it very difficult, for whenever too great a gap came, "'the spider, spinning a strong cord, stretched it just where they would have chosen "'to put their foot next. He left them in his nest, after bringing them two enormous honey-bags taken from bees that he had caught, but presently about six of the wisest of the spiders came back with him. It was rather horrible to look up and see them all around the mouth of the nest, looking down on them in contemplation, as if wondering whether they would be nice eating. At length one of them said, "'Tell us truly what you want with the eagle, and we will try to help you.' Then Trixie Wee told them that there was a giant on the borders who treated little children no better than radishes, and that they had narrowly escaped being eaten by him, that they had found out that the great she-eagle of Mount Skycrack was at present sitting on his heart, and that, if they could only get hold of the heart, they would soon teach the giant better behaviour. But, said the host, if you get at the heart of the giant, you will find it as large as one of your elephants. What can you do with it? The least scratch will kill it, replied Buffy Bob. Ah, but you might do better than that, said the spider. Now we have resolved to help you. Here is a little bag of spider juice. The giants cannot bear spiders, and this juice is dreadful poison to them. We are all ready to go up with you and drive the eagle away. "'Then you must put the heart into this other bag "'and bring it down with you, "'for then the giant will be in your power.' "'But how can we do that?' said Buffy. "'The bag is not much bigger than a pudding-bag. "'But it is as large as you will be able to carry.' "'Yes, but what are we to do with the heart?' "'Put it in the bag, to be sure. "'Only first you must squeeze a drop out of the other bag upon it. "'You will see what will happen.' "'Very well. We will do as you tell us,' said Trixie Wee. "'And now, if you please, how shall we go?' "'Oh, that's our business,' said the first spider. "'You come with me, and my grandfather will take your brother. Get up!' So Trixie Wee mounted on the narrow part of the spider's back, and held fast. And Buffy Bob got on the grandfather's back. And up they scrambled, over one web after another, up and up so fast. And every spider followed so that when Trixie Wee looked back, she saw a whole army of spiders scrambling after them. "'What can we want with so many?' she thought, but she said nothing. The moon was now up, and it was a splendid sight below and around them. All giant land was spread out under them, with its great hills, lakes, trees and animals. And all above them was the clear heaven, and Mount Skycrack rising into it, with its endless ladders of spider-webs, glittering like cords made of moonbeams. And up the moonbeams went, crawling and scrambling and racing, a huge army of spiders. At length they reached all but the very summit, where they stopped. Trixie Wee and Buffy Bob could see above them a great globe of feathers that finished off the mountain like an ornamental knob. "'But how shall we drive her off?' said Buffy. "'We'll soon manage that,' answered the grandfather spider. "'Come on, you, down there.' Up rushed the whole army, past the children, over the edge of the nest, on to the she-eagle, 
and buried themselves in her feathers. In a moment she became very restless, and went pecking about her with her beak. All at once she spread out her wings, with a sound like a whirlwind, and flew off to bathe in the sea. And then the spiders began to drop from her nest in all directions on their gossamer wings. The children had to hold fast to keep the wind of the eagle's flight from blowing them off. As soon as it was over, they looked into the nest, and there lay the giant's heart, an awful and ugly thing. "'Make haste, child,' said Trixie Spider. So Trixie took her bag and squeezed a drop out of it upon the heart. She thought she heard the giant give a far-off roar of pain, and she nearly fell from her seat with terror. The heart instantly began to shrink. It shrunk and shriveled till it was nearly gone, and Buffy Bob caught it up and put it into his bag. Then the two spiders turned and went down again as fast as they could. Before they got to the bottom they heard the shrieks of the she-eagle over the loss of her egg. But the spiders told them not to be alarmed, for her eyes were too big to see them. By the time they reached the foot of the mountain, all the spiders had got home, and were busy again catching flies as if nothing had happened. After renewed thanks to their friends, the children set off, carrying the giant's heart with them. "'If you should find it at all troublesome, just give it a little more spider-juice directly,' said the grandfather, as they took their leave. Now the giant had given an awful roar of pain the moment they anointed his heart, and had fallen down in a fit, in which he lay so long that all the boys might have escaped, if they had not been so fat. One did, and got home in safety. For days the giant was unable to speak. The first words he uttered were, "'Oh, my heart! my heart!' "'Your heart is safe enough, dear Thunderthump,' said his wife. "'Really, a man of your size ought not to be so nervous and apprehensive. I am ashamed of you.' "'You have no heart, Doodlem,' answered he. I assure you that at this moment mine is in the greatest danger. It has fallen into the hands of foes, though who they are I cannot tell. Here he fainted again, for Trixie Wee, finding the heart begin to swell a little, had given it the least touch of spider-juice. Again he recovered, and said, Dear Doodlem, my heart is coming back to me. It is coming nearer and nearer. After lying silent for hours, he exclaimed, "'It is in the house, I know!' And he jumped up and walked about, looking in every corner. As he rose, Trixie Wee and Buffy Bob came out of the hole in the tree-root, and through the cat-hole in the door, and walked boldly towards the giant. Both kept their eyes busy watching him. Led by the love of his own heart, the giant soon spied them and staggered furiously towards them. "'I will eat you, vermin!' he cried. "'Here with my heart!' Trixie gave the heart a sharp pinch. Down fell the giant on his knees, blubbering and crying, and begging for his heart. "'You shall have it, if you behave yourself properly,' said Trixie. "'How shall I behave myself properly?' asked he, whimpering. "'Take all those boys and girls, and carry them home at once.' "'I'm not able. I'm too ill. I should fall down.' Take them up directly. I can't, till you give me my heart. Very well, said Trixie, and she gave the heart another pinch. The giant jumped to his feet, and catching up all the children, thrust some into his waistcoat pockets, and some into his breast pocket, put two or three into his hat, and took a bundle of them under each arm, and he staggered to the door. All this time poor Doodlem was sitting in her armchair, crying and mending a white stocking. The giant led the way to the borders. He could not go so fast but that Buffy and Trixie managed to keep up with him. When they reached the borders, they thought it would be safer to let the children find their own way home. So they told him to set them down. He obeyed. "'Have you put them all down, Mr. Thunderthump?' asked Trixie Wee. "'Yes.' said the giant. "'That's a lie!' squeaked a little voice, and out came a head from his waistcoat pocket. Trixie Wee pinched the heart till the giant roared with pain. "'You're not a gentleman. 
"'You tell stories,' she said. "'He was the thinnest of the lot,' said Thunderthump, crying. "'Are you all there now, children?' asked Trixie. "'Yes, ma'am,' returned they, after counting themselves very carefully, and with some difficulty, for they were all stupid children. "'Now,' said Trixie Wee to the giant, "'will you promise to carry off no more children, and never to eat a child again all your life?' "'Yes, yes, I promise,' answered Thunderthump, sobbing. "'And you will never cross the borders of Giantland? "'Never.' and you shall never again wear white stockings on a Sunday all your life long. Do you promise?" The giant hesitated at this, and began to expostulate, but Trixie Wee, believing it would be good for his morals, insisted, and the giant promised. Then she required of him that, when she gave him back his heart, he should give it to his wife to take care of for him for ever after. The poor giant fell on his knees, and began to beg. But Trixie Wee, giving the heart a slight pinch, he bawled out, "'Yes, yes, Doodlem shall have it, I swear, and she must not put it in the flour-barrel or the, or the dust-hole.' "'Certainly not. Make your own bargain with her. And you promise not to interfere with my brother and me, to take any revenge for what we have done. Yes, yes, my dear children, I promise everything. Do, pray, make haste and give me back my poor heart. Wait there, then, till I bring it to you. "'Yes, yes, only make haste, for I feel very faint.' Trixie Wee began to undo the mouth of the bag, but Buffy Bob, who had got very knowing on his travels, took out his knife, with a pretense of cutting the string, but in reality to be prepared for any emergency. No sooner was the heart out of the bag than it expanded to the size of a bullock, and the giant, with a yell of rage and vengeance, rushed on the two children who had stepped sideways from the terrible heart, but Buffy Bob was too quick for Thunderthump. He sprang to the heart, and buried his knife in it up to the hilt. A fountain of blood spouted from it, and with a dreadful groan the giant fell dead at the feet of little Trixie Wee, who could not help being sorry for him, after all. End of the Giant's Heart From the Light Princess and Other Fairy Tales Part One of the Golden Key from the Light Princess and Other Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Clive Catterall. Part One of the Golden Key from the Light Princess and Other Fairy Tales by George MacDonald. There was a boy who used to sit in the twilight and listen to his great-aunt's stories. She told him that if he could reach the place where the end of the rainbow stands, he would find there a golden key. "'And what is the key for?' the boy would ask. "'What is it the key of? What will it open?' "'That nobody knows,' his aunt would reply. "'He has to find that out.' "'I suppose, being gold,' the boy once said thoughtfully, "'that I could get a good deal of money for it if I sold it.' "'Better never find it than sell it,' returned his aunt. And then the boy went to bed and dreamed about the golden key. Now, all that his great-aunt told the boy about the golden key would have been nonsense had it not been that their little house stood on the borders of fairyland for it is perfectly well known that, out of fairyland, nobody ever can find where the rainbow stands. The creature takes such good care of its golden key, always flitting from place to place, lest anyone should find it. But in fairyland it is quite different. Things that look real in this country look very thin indeed in fairyland, while some of the things that here cannot stand still for a moment will not move there. So it was not in the least absurd of the old lady to tell her nephew such things about the golden key. "'Did you ever know anybody find it?' he asked one evening. "'Yes. Your father, I believe, found it.' "'And what did he do with it? Can you tell me?' "'He never told me.' 
What was it like? He never showed it to me. Does a new key come there always? I don't know. There it is. Perhaps it is the rainbow's egg. <laughs> Perhaps it is. You will be a happy boy if you find the nest. Perhaps it comes tumbling down the rainbow from the sky. Perhaps it does. One evening in summer he went into his own room and stood at the lattice window and gazed into the forest which fringed the outskirts of Fairyland. It came close up to his great-aunt's garden and, indeed, sent some straggling trees into it. The forest lay to the east and the sun, which was setting behind the cottage, looked straight into the dark wood with its level red eye. The trees were all old and had few branches below so that the sun could see a great way into the forest, and the boy, being keen-sighted, could see almost as far as the sun. The trunks stood like rows of red columns in the shine of the red sun, and he could see down aisle after aisle in the vanishing distance, and as he gazed into the forest he began to feel as if the trees were all waiting for him, and had something they could not go on with until he came to them. But he was hungry and wanted his supper, so he lingered. Suddenly, far among the trees, as far as the sun could shine, he saw a glorious thing. It was the end of the rainbow, large and brilliant. He could count all the seven colours, and could see shade after shade beyond the violet, while before the red stood a colour more gorgeous and mysterious still. It was a colour he had never seen before, only the spring of the rainbow arch was visible. He could see nothing of it above the trees. The golden key, he said to himself, and darted out of the house and into the wood. He had not gone far before the sun set, but the rainbow only glowed the brighter, for the rainbow of fairyland is not dependent upon the sun as ours is. The trees welcomed him. The bushes made way for him. The rainbow grew larger and brighter, and at length he found himself within two trees of it. It was a grand sight, burning away there in silence, with its gorgeous, it, its lovely, its delicate colours, each distinct, all combining. He could now see a great deal more of it. It rose high into the blue heavens, but bent so little that he could not tell how high the crown of the arch must reach. It was still only a small portion of a huge bow. He stood gazing at it till he forgot himself with delight, even forgot the key which he had come to seek. And as he stood it grew more wonderful still, for in each of the colours, which was as large as the column of a church, he could faintly see beautiful forms slowly ascending as if by the steps of a winding stair. The forms appeared irregularly, now one, now many, now several, now none, men and women and children, all different, all beautiful. He drew nearer to the rainbow. It vanished. He started back a step in dismay. It was there again, as beautiful as ever. So he contented himself with standing as near it as he might, and watching the forms that ascend the glorious colours towards the unknown height of the arch which did not end abruptly, but faded away in the blue air so gradually that he could not say where it ceased. When the thought of the golden key returned, the boy very wisely proceeded to mark out in his mind the space covered by the foundation of the rainbow, in order that he might know where to search should the rainbow disappear. It was based chiefly upon a bed of moss. Meantime it had grown quite dark in the wood, the rainbow alone was visible by its own light, but the moment the moon rose, the rainbow vanished. Nor could any change of place restore the vision to the boy's eyes, so he threw himself down upon the mossy bed, to wait till the sunlight would give him a chance of finding the key. There he fell fast asleep. When he woke in the morning, the sun was looking straight into his eyes. He turned away from it and the same moment saw a brilliant little thing lying on the moss within a foot of his face. It was the golden key. The pipe of it was of plain gold, as bright as gold could be. The handle 
was curiously wrought and set with sapphires. In a terror of delight he put out his hand and took it, and had it. He lay for a while, turning it over and over, and feeding his eyes upon its beauty. Then he jumped to his feet, remembering that the pretty thing was of no use to him yet. Where was the lock to which the key belonged? It must be somewhere, for how could anybody be so silly as make a key for which there was no lock? Where should he go to look for it? He gazed about him, up into the air, down to the earth, but saw no keyhole in the clouds, in the grass, or in the trees. Just as he began to grow disconsolate, however, he saw something glimmering in the wood. It was a mere glimmer that he saw, but he took it for a glimmer of a rainbow, and went towards it. And now I will go back to the borders of the forest. Not far from the house where the boy had lived, there was another house, the owner of which was a merchant, who was much away from the home. He had lost his wife some years before, and had only one child, a little girl whom he left in the charge of two servants, who were very idle and careless. So she was neglected and left untidy, and was sometimes ill-used besides. Now it is well known that the little creatures, commonly called fairies, though there are many different kinds of fairies in fairyland, have an exceeding dislike to untidiness. Indeed, they are quite spiteful to slovenly people. Being used to all the lovely ways of the trees and flowers, and to the neatness of the birds and all woodland creatures, it makes them feel miserable, even in their deep woods and on the grassy carpets, to think that within the same moonlight lies a dirty, uncomfortable, slovenly house. And this makes them angry with the people that live in it, and they would gladly drive them out of the world if they could. They want the whole earth nice and clean. So they pinch the maids black and blue, and play them all manner of uncomfortable tricks. But this house was quite a shame, and the fairies in the forest could not endure it. They tried everything on the maids without effect, and at last resolved upon making a clean riddance, beginning with a the child. They ought to have known that it was not her fault, but they have little principle and much mischief in them, and they thought that if they got rid of her, the maids would be sure to be turned away. So one evening, the poor little girl, having been put to bed early, before the sun was down, the servants went off to the village, locking the door behind them. The child did not know she was alone, and lay contentedly looking out of her window towards the forest, of which, however, she could not see much, because of the ivy and other creeping plants which had straggled across her window. All at once she saw an ape making faces at her out of the mirror, and the heads carved upon a great old wardrobe grinning fearfully. Then two old spider-legged chairs came forward into the middle of the room and began to dance a queer old-fashioned dance. This set her laughing, and she forgot the ape and the grinning heads. So the fairies saw they had made a mistake, and sent the chairs back to their places but they knew that she had been reading the story of Silverhair all day. So the next moment she heard the voices of the three bears upon the stair, big voice, middle voice, and little voice, and she heard their soft, heavy tread, as if they had stockings over their boots, coming nearer and nearer to the door of her room, till she could bear it no longer. She did just as Silverhair did, and as the fairies wanted her to do. She darted to the window, pulled it open, got upon the ivy, and so scrambled to the ground. Then she fled to the forest as fast as she could run. Now, although she did not know it, this was the very best way she could have gone, for nothing is ever so mischievous in its own place as it is out of it. And besides, these mischievous creatures were only the children of Fairyland, as it were, and there are many other beings there as well. And if a wanderer gets in among them, the good ones will always help him more than the evil ones will be able to hurt him. The sun was now set, and the darkness coming on, but the child thought of no danger but the bears behind her. If she had looked round, however, she would have seen that she was followed by a very different creature from a bear. 
It was a curious creature, made like a fish, but covered, instead of scales, with feathers of all colours, sparkling like those of a hummingbird. It had fins, not wings, and swam through the air as a fish does through the water. Its head was like the head of a small owl. After running a long way, and as the last of the light was disappearing, she passed under a tree with drooping branches. It dropped its branches to the ground all about her, and caught her as a trap. She struggled to get out, but the branches pressed her closer and closer to the trunk. She was in great terror and distress when the air-fish, swimming into the thicket of branches, began tearing them with its beak. They loosened their hold at once, and the creature went on attacking them, till at length they let the child go. Then the air-fish came from behind her and swam out in front, glittering and sparkling all lovely colours, and she followed. It led her gently along, till all at once it swam in at a cottage door. The child followed still. There was a bright fire in the middle of the floor, upon which stood a pot without a lid, full of water that boiled and bubbled furiously. The air-fish swam straight to the pot and into the boiling water, where it lay quiet. A beautiful woman rose from the opposite side of the fire, and came to meet the girl. She took her up in her arms and said, "'Ah, you are come at last. I have been looking for you a long time.' She sat down with her on her lap, and there the girl sat staring at her. She had never seen anything so beautiful. She was tall and strong, with white arms and neck, and a delicate flush on her face. The child could not tell what was the colour of her hair, but could not help thinking it had a tinge of dark green. She had not one ornament upon her, but she looked as if she had just put off quantities of diamonds and emeralds. Yet here she was in the simplest, poorest little cottage, where she was evidently at home. She was dressed in shining green. The girl looked at the lady and the lady looked at the girl. "'What is your name?' asked the lady. "'The servants always call me Tangle.' "'Ah, that was because your hair was so untidy. "'But that was their fault, the naughty women. "'Still, it is a pretty name, and I will call you Tangle too. "'You must not mind my asking you questions, "'for you may ask me the same questions, every one of them and any others that you like. How old are you?" Ten, answered Tangle. "'You don't look like it,' said the lady. "'How old are you, please?' returned Tangle. "'Thousands of years old,' answered the lady. "'You don't look like it,' said Tangle. "'Don't I?' "'I think I do. Don't you see how beautiful I am?' and her great blue eyes looked down on the little tangle, as if all the stars in the sky were melted in them to make their brightness. "'Ah, but,' said Tangle, "'when people live long they grow old. At least I always thought so.' "'I have no time to grow old,' said the lady. "'I am too busy for that. It is very idle to grow old. But I cannot have my little girl so untidy. Do you know I can't find a clean spot on your face to kiss?' Perhaps, suggested Tangle, feeling ashamed, but not too much so, to say a word for herself. Perhaps it is because the tree made me cry so. My poor darling, said the lady, looking now as if the moon were melted in her eyes, and kissing her little face, dirty as it was. The naughty tree must suffer for making a girl cry. And what is your name, please? asked Tangle. Grandmother, answered the lady. Is it really? Yes, indeed. I never tell stories, even in fun. How good of you! I couldn't if I tried. It would come true if I said it, and then I should be punished enough. And she smiled like the sun through a summer shower. But now, she went on, I must get you washed and dressed, and then we shall have some supper. Oh, I had supper long ago, said Tangle. Yes, indeed you had, answered the lady. Three years ago. You don't know that it is three years since you ran away from the bears. You are thirteen and more now. Tangle could only stare. 
she felt quite sure it was true. "'You will not be afraid of anything I do with you, will you?' said the lady. "'I will try very hard not to be, but I can't be certain, you know,' replied Tangle. "'I like your saying so, and I shall be quite satisfied,' answered the lady. She took off the girl's nightgown, rose with her in her arms, and going to the wall of the cottage, opened a door. Then Tangle saw a deep tank, the sides of which were filled with green plants, which had flowers of all colours. There was a roof over it, like the roof of a cottage. It was filled with beautiful clear water, in which swam a multitude of such fishes as the one that had led her to the cottage. It was the light their colours gave that showed the place in which they were. The lady spoke some words Tangle could not understand, and threw her into the tank. The fishes came crowding about her. Two or three of them got under her head and kept it up. The rest of them rubbed themselves all over her, and with their wet feathers washed her quite clean. Then the lady, who had been looking on all the time, spoke again, whereupon some thirty or forty of the fishes rose out of the water underneath Tangle, and so bore her up to the arms the lady held out to take her. She carried her back to the fire, and having dried her well, opened a chest, and taking out the finest linen garments, smelling of grass and lavender, put them upon her, and over all a green dress, just like her own, shining like hers and soft like hers, and going into just such lovely folds from the waist, where it was tied with a brown cord, to her bare feet. "'Won't you give me a pair of shoes too, Grandmother?' said Tangle. "'No, my dear. No shoes. Look here. I wear no shoes.' So saying, she lifted her dress a little, and there were the loveliest white feet, but no shoes. Then Tangle was content to go without shoes too, and the lady sat down with her again, and combed her hair, and brushed it, and then left it to dry while she got the supper. First she got bread out of one hole in the wall, then milk out of another, then several kinds of fruit out of a third, and then she went to the pot on the fire, and took out the fish, now nicely cooked, and, as soon as she had pulled off its feathered skin, ready to be eaten. But, exclaimed Tangle, she stared at the fish, and could say no more. I know what you mean, returned the lady. You do not like to eat the messenger that brought you home. But it is the kindest return you can make. The creature was afraid to go until it saw me put the pot on, and heard me promise it should be boiled the moment it returned with you. Then it darted out of the door at once. You saw it go into the pot of itself the moment it entered, did you not? I did, answered Tangle, and I thought it very strange. But then I saw you, and forgot all about the fish. In Fairyland, resumed the lady, as they sat down to the table, the ambition of the animals is to be eaten by the people, for that is their highest end in that condition. But they are not therefore destroyed. Out of the pot comes something more than the dead fish, you will see. Tangle now remarked that the lid was on the pot, but the lady took no further notice of it till they had eaten the fish, which Tangle found nicer than any fish he had ever tasted before. It was as white as snow, and as delicate as cream. And the moment she had swallowed a mouthful of it, a change she could not describe began to take place in her. She heard a murmuring all about her, which became more and more articulate, and at length, as she went on eating, grew intelligible. By the time she had finished her share, the sounds of all the animals in the forest came crowding through the door to her ears for the door still stood wide open, though it was pitch dark outside, and they were no longer sounds only, they were speech, and speech that she could understand. She could tell what the insects in the cottage were saying to each other too. She even had a suspicion that the trees and flowers all about the cottage were holding midnight communications with each other, but what they said she could not hear. As soon as the fish was eaten, the lady went to the fire and took the lid off the pot. A lovely little creature in human shape, with large white wings, rose out of it, and flew round and round the roof of the cottage, then dropped, fluttering, and nestled in the lap of the lady. 
She spoke to it some strange words, carried it to the door, and threw it out into the darkness. Tangle heard the flapping of its wings die away in the distance. Now, have we done the fish any harm? she said, returning. No, answered Tangle. I do not think we have. I should not mind eating one every day. They must wait their time, like you and me too, my little Tangle. And she smiled a smile, which the sadness in it made more lovely. But, she continued, I think we may have one for our supper tomorrow. So saying, she went to the door of the tank, and spoke, and now Tangle understood her perfectly. I want one of you, she said, the wisest. Thereupon the fishes got together in the middle of the tank, with their heads forming a circle above the water, and their tails a larger circle beneath it. They were holding a council, in which their relative wisdom should be determined. At length one of them flew up into the lady's hand, looking lively and ready. "'You know where the rainbow stands?' she asked. "'Yes, mother, quite well,' answered the fish. "'Bring home a young man you will find there, who does not know where to go.' The fish was out of the door in a moment. Then the lady told Tangle it was time to go to bed, and opening another door in the side of the cottage, showed her a little arbour, cool and green, with a bed of purple heath growing in it, upon which she threw a large wrapper made of the feathered skins of the wise fishes, shining gorgeous in the firelight. Tangle was soon lost in the strangest, loveliest dreams, and the beautiful lady was in every one of her dreams. In the morning she woke to the rustling of leaves over her head, and the sound of running water. But to her surprise she could find no door, nothing but the moss-grown wall of the cottage. So she crept through an opening in the arbour, and stood in the forest. Then she bathed in a stream that ran merrily through the trees, and felt happier. For having once been in her grandmother's pond, she must be clean and tidy ever after, and having put on her green dress, felt like a lady. She spent that day in the wood, listening to the birds and beasts and creeping things. She understood all that they said, though she could not repeat a word of it, and every kind had a different language, while there was a common, though more limited, understanding between all the inhabitants of the forest. She saw nothing of the beautiful lady, but she felt that she was near her all the time, and she took care not to go out of sight of the cottage. It was round like a snow-hut or a wigwam, and she could see neither door nor window in it. The fact was, it had no windows, and though it was full of doors, they all opened from the inside, and could not even be seen from the outside. She was standing at the foot of a tree in the twilight, listening to a quarrel between a mole and a squirrel, in which the mole told the squirrel that the tail was the best of him, and the squirrel called the mole spade-fists, when the darkness having deepened round her, she became aware of something shining in her face, and looking round saw that the door of the cottage was open, and the red light of the fire flowing from it like a river through the darkness. She left Mole and Squirrel to settle matters as they might, and darted off to the cottage. Entering, she found the pot boiling on the fire, and the grand lovely lady sitting on the other side of it. "'I've been watching you all day,' said the lady. "'You shall have something to eat by and by, "'but we must wait until our supper comes home.' "'She took Tangle on her knee, "'and began to sing to her. "'Such songs as made her wish "'she could listen to them for ever. "'But at length in rushed the shining fish "'and snuggled down in the pot. "'It was followed by a youth "'who had outgrown his worn garments. "'His face was ruddy with health, and in his right hand he carried a little jewel which sparkled in the firelight. The first words the lady said were, "'What is that in your hand, Mossy?' Now Mossy was the name his companions had given him, because he had a favourite stone covered with moss, on which he used to sit whole days reading. And they said the moss had begun to grow upon him too. Mossy held out his hand. The moment the lady saw that it was the golden key, she rose from her chair, kissed Mossy on the forehead, made him sit down on her seat, and stood before him like a servant. Mossy could not bear this, and rose at once, but the lady begged him, with tears in her beautiful eyes, to sit, and let her wait upon him. 
"'But you are a great, splendid, beautiful lady,' said Mossy. "'Yes, I am, but I work all day long. That is my pleasure. And you will have to leave me so soon.' "'How do you know that, if you please, madam?' asked Mossy. "'Because you've got the golden key.' "'But I don't know what it is for. I can't find the keyhole. Will you tell me what to do?' "'You must look for the keyhole. That is your work. I cannot help you. I can only tell you that if you look for it you will find it. What kind of box will it open? What is there inside? I do not know. I dream about it, but I know nothing. Must I go at once? You may stop here to-night and have some of my supper, but you must go in the morning. All I can do for you is to give you clothes. Here is a girl called Tangle, whom you must take with you. That will be nice, said Mossy. No, no, said Tangle. I do not want to leave you. Please, Grandmother. You must go with him, Tangle. I am sorry to lose you, but it will be the best thing for you. Even the fishes, you see, have to go into the pot and then out into the dark. If you fall in with the old man of the sea, mind you ask him whether he has not got some more fishes ready for me. My tank is getting thin. So saying, she took the fish from the pot and put the lid on as before. They sat down and ate the fish, and then the winged creature rose from the pot, circled the roof, and settled on the lady's lap. She talked to it, carried it to the door, and threw it out into the dark. They heard the flap of its wings die away in the distance. The lady then showed Mossy into just such another chamber as that of Tangle, and in the morning he found a suit of clothes laid beside him. He looked very handsome in them. But the wearer of grandmother's clothes never thinks about how he or she looks, but thinks always how handsome other people are. Tangle was very unwilling to go. "'Why should I leave you? I don't know the young man,' she said to the lady. "'I am never allowed to keep my children long. You need not go with him except you please, but you must go some day. And I should like you to go with him, for he has the golden key.' No girl need be afraid to go with a youth that has the golden key. You will take care of her, Mossy, will you not? That I will, said Mossy. And Tangle cast a glance at him, as though she would like to go with him. And, said the lady, if you should lose each other as you go through the... the... ah... Uh, I never can remember the name of that country. Do not be afraid, but go on and on. She kissed Tangle on the mouth, and Mossy on the forehead led them to the door, and waved her hand eastward. Mossy and Tangle took each other's hand, and walked away into the depth of the forest. In his right hand Mossy held the golden key. End of Part 1 of The Golden Key Part two of the Golden Key from the Light Princess and Other Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Clive Catterall. Part two of the Golden Key from the Light Princess and Other Fairy Tales by George MacDonald. They wandered thus a long way, with endless amusement from the talk of the animals. They soon learned enough of their language to ask them necessary questions. The squirrels were always friendly, and gave them nuts out of their own hoards, but the bees were selfish and rude, justifying themselves on the ground that Tangle and Mossy were not subjects of their queen, and charity must begin at home, though indeed they had not one drone in their poorhouse at the time. Even the blinking moles would fetch them an earth-nut, or a truffle now and then, talking as if their mouths, as well as their eyes and ears, were full of cotton wool, or their own velvety fur. By the time they got out of the forest they were very fond of each other, and Tangle was not in the least sorry that her grandmother had sent her away with Mossy. At length the trees grew smaller and stood further apart, and the ground began to rise 
and it got more and more steep, till the trees were all left behind, and the two were climbing a narrow path with rocks on each side. Suddenly they came upon a rude doorway, by which they entered a narrow gully cut in the rock. It grew darker and darker, till it was pitch dark, and they had to feel their way. At length the light began to return, and at last they came out upon a narrow path on the face of a lofty precipice. This path went winding down the rock to a wide plain, circular in shape, and surrounded on all sides by mountains. Those opposite to them were a great way off, and towered to an awful height, shooting up sharp, blue, ice-enameled pinnacles. An utter silence reigned where they stood. Not even the sound of water reached them. Looking down, they could not tell whether the valley below was a grassy plain or a great still lake. They had never seen any space look like it. The way to it was difficult and dangerous, but down the narrow path they went, and reached the bottom in safety. They found it composed of smooth, light-coloured sandstone, undulating in parts, but mostly level. It was no wonder to them now that they had not been able to tell what it was, for this surface was everywhere crowded with shadows. The mass was chiefly made up of the shadows of leaves, innumerable, of all lovely and imaginative forms, waving to and fro, floating and quivering in the breath of a breeze whose motion was unfelt, whose sound was unheard. No forests clothed the mountain sides, no trees were anywhere to be seen, and yet the shadows of the leaves, branches, and stems of all various trees covered the valley as far as their eyes could reach. They soon spied the shadows of flowers mingled with those of leaves, and now and then the shadow of a bird with open beak and throat distended with song. At times would appear the forms of strange, graceful creatures running up and down the shadow bowls and along the branches to disappear in the wind-tossed foliage. As they walked, they waded knee-deep in the lovely lake, for the shadows were not merely lying on the surface of the ground, but heaped up above it like substantial forms of darkness, as if they had been cast upon a thousand different planes of the air. Tangle and Mossy often lifted their heads and gazed upwards to descry whence the shadows came, but they could see nothing more than a bright mist spread above them, higher than the tops of the mountains, which stood clear against it. No forests, no leaves, no birds were visible. After a while they reached more open spaces, where the shadows were thinner, and came even to portions over which shadows only flitted, leaving them clear for such as might follow. Now a wonderful form, half bird-like, half human, would float across on outspread sailing pinions. Anon an exquisite shadow group of gambling children would be followed by the loveliest female form, and that again by the grand stride of a titanic shape each disappearing in the surrounding press of shadowy foliage. Sometimes a profile of unspeakable beauty or grandeur would appear for a moment and vanish. Sometimes they seemed lovers that passed linked arm in arm, sometimes father and son, sometimes brothers in loving contest, sometimes sisters entwined in gracefulest community of complex form. Sometimes wild horses would tear across, free or bestrode by noble shadows of ruling men, but some of the things which pleased them most they never knew how to describe. About the middle of the plain they sat down to rest in the heart of a heap of shadows. After sitting for a while, each, looking up, saw the other in tears. They were each longing after the country whence the shadows fell. "'We must find the country from which the shadows come,' said Mossy. "'We must, dear Mossy,' responded Tangle. "'What if your golden key should be the key to it?' "'Ah, that would be grand,' returned Mossy. "'But we must rest here for a little, "'and then we shall be able to cross the plain before night.' So he lay down on the ground, and about him on every side, and over his head, was the constant play of the wonderful shadows. He could look through them and see to one behind the other, till they mixed in a mass of darkness. 
Tangle, too, lay admiring and wondering, and longing after the country whence the shadows came. When they were rested, they rose and pursued their journey. How long they were in crossing the plain I cannot tell, but before night Mossy's hair was streaked with grey, and Tangle had got wrinkles on her forehead. As evening grew on, the shadows fell deeper and rose higher. At length they reached a place where they rose above their heads and made all dark around them. Then they took hold of each other's hand and walked on in silence, and in some dismay. They felt the gathering darkness, and something strangely solemn besides, and the beauty of the shadows ceased to delight them. All at once Tangle found that she had not a hold of Mossy's hand, though when she lost it she could not tell. "'Mossy! Mossy!' she cried aloud in terror. But no Mossy replied. A moment after the shadows sank to her feet, and down under her feet and the mountain rose before her. She turned towards the gloomy region she had left, and called once more upon Mossy. There the gloom lay tossing and heaving a dark, stormy, foamless sea of shadows, but no Mossy rose out of it, or came climbing up the hill on which she stood. She threw herself down and wept in despair. Suddenly she remembered that the beautiful lady had told them if they lost each other in a country of which she could not remember the name, they were not to be afraid, but to go straight on. And besides, she said to herself, Mossy has the golden key, and so no harm will come to him, I do believe. She rose from the ground and went on. Before long she arrived at a precipice in the face of which a stair was cut. When she had ascended half-way the stair ceased, and the path led straight into the mountain. She was afraid to enter, and turning again towards the stair grew giddy at the sight of the depth beneath her, and was forced to throw herself down in the mouth of the cave. When she opened her eyes she saw a beautiful little figure with wings standing beside her, waiting. "'I know you,' said Tangle. "'You are my fish.' "'Yes, but I am a fish no longer. I am an Aeranth now.' "'What is that?' asked Tangle. "'What you see I am,' answered the shape. "'And I am come to lead you through the mountain.' "'Oh, thank you, dear fish, uh, Aeranth, I mean,' returned Tangle, rising. Thereupon the Aeranth took to his wings, and flew on through the long, narrow passage, reminding Tangle very much of the way he had swum on before her when he was a fish. And the moment his white wings moved, they began to throw off a continuous shower of sparks of all colours, which lighted up the passage before them. All at once he vanished, and Tangle heard a low, sweet sound, quite different from the rush and crackle of his wings. Before her was an open arch, and through it came a light, mixed with the sound of sea-waves. She hurried out, and fell, tired and happy, upon the yellow sand of the shore. There she lay, half asleep with weariness and rest, listening to the low plash and retreat of the tiny waves, which seemed ever enticing the land to leave off being land and become sea. And as she lay, her eyes were fixed upon the foot of a great rainbow standing far away against the sky on the other side of the sea. At length she fell fast asleep. When she awoke she saw an old man with long white hair down to his shoulders, leaning upon a stick covered with green buds, and so bending over her. "'What do you want here, beautiful woman?' he said. "'Am I beautiful?' "'I am so glad,' said Tangle, rising. "'My grandmother is beautiful.' "'Yes. But what do you want?' he repeated kindly. "'I think I want you. Are not you the old man of the sea?' "'I am.' "'Then, Grandmother says, have you any more fishes ready for her?' "'We will go and see, my dear,' answered the old man, speaking yet more kindly than before. "'And I can do something for you, can I not?' "'Yes.' "'Show me the way to the country from which the shadows fall,' said Tangle. "'For there she hoped to find Mossy again. "'Ah! Indeed, that would be worth doing,' said the old man. "'But I cannot, for I do not know the way myself. 
but I will send you to the old man of the earth. Perhaps he can tell you. He is much older than I am. Leaning on his staff, he conducted her along the shore to a steep rock that looked like a petrified ship turned upside down. The door of it was the rudder of a great vessel, ages ago at the bottom of the sea. Immediately within the door was a stair in the rock, down which the old man went, and Tangle followed. At the bottom the old man had his house, and there he lived. As soon as she entered it, Tangle heard a strange noise, unlike anything she had ever heard before. She soon found that it was the fishes talking. She tried to understand what they said, but their speech was so old-fashioned and rude and undefined that she could not make much of it. "'I will go and see about those fishes for my daughter,' said the old man of the sea. And moving a slide in the wall of his house, he first looked out and then tapped upon a thick piece of crystal that filled the round opening. Tangle came up behind him, and peeping through the window into the heart of the great deep green ocean, she saw the most curious creatures, some very ugly, all very odd, and with especially queer mouths, swimming about everywhere, above and below, but all coming towards the window in answer to the tap of the old man of the sea. Only a few could get their mouths against the glass, but those who were floating miles away yet turned their heads towards it. The old man looked through the whole flock carefully for some minutes, and then, turning to Tangle, said, "'I am sorry. I have not got one ready yet. I want more time than she does, but I will send some as soon as I can.' He then shut the slide. Presently a great noise arose in the sea. The old man opened the slide again, and tapped on the glass, whereupon the fishes were all as still as sleep. "'They were only talking about you,' he said, "'and they do speak such nonsense. "'Tomorrow,' he continued, "'I must show you the way to the old man of the earth. "'He lives a long way from here.' "'Do let me go at once,' said Tangle. "'No, that is not possible. "'You must come this way first. "'He led her to a hole in the wall which she had not observed before. It was covered with the green leaves and white blossoms of a creeping plant. "'Only white blossoming plants can grow under the sea,' said the old man. "'In there you will find a bath, in which you must lie till I call you.' Tangle went in and found a smaller room or cave, in the further corner of which was a great basin hollowed out of a rock, and half full of the clearest sea-water. Little streams were constantly running into it from cracks in the wall of the cavern. It was polished quite smooth inside, and had a carpet of yellow sand in the bottom of it. Large green leaves and white flowers of various plants crowded up and over it, draping and covering it almost entirely. No sooner was she undressed and lying in the bath than she began to feel as if the water was sinking into her and she were receiving all the good of sleep without undergoing its forgetfulness. She felt the good coming all of the time, and she grew happier and more hopeful than she had been since she had lost Mossy. But she could not help thinking how very sad it was for a poor old man to live there all alone, and have to take care of a whole sea full of stupid and riotous fishes. After about an hour, as she thought, she heard his voice calling her, and rose out of the bath. All the fatigue and aching of her long journey had vanished. She was as whole and strong and well as if she had slept for seven days. Returning to the opening that led into the other part of the house, she started back with amazement, for through it she saw the form of a grand man, with a majestic and beautiful face waiting for her. "'Come,' he said, "'I see you are ready.' She entered with reverence. "'Where is the old man of the sea?' she asked humbly. "'There is no one here but me,' he answered, smiling. "'Some people call me the old man of the sea. Others have another name for me, and are terribly frightened when they meet me taking a walk by the shore. Therefore I avoid being seen by them, for they are so afraid that they never see what I really am. "'You see me now,' 
but I must show you the way to the old man of the earth. He led her into the cave where the bath was, and there she saw, in the opposite corner, a second opening in the rock. Go down that stair, and it will bring you to him, said the old man of the sea. With humble thanks, Tangle took her leave. She went down the winding stair, till she began to fear that there was no end to it. Still down and down it went, rough and broken, with springs of water bursting out of the rocks and running down the steps beside her. It was quite dark about her, and yet she could see, for after being in that bath people's eyes always give out a light they can see by. There were no creeping things in the way. All was safe and pleasant, though so dark and damp and deep. At last there was not one step more, and she found herself in a glimmering cave. On a stone in the middle of it sat a figure with its back towards her, the figure of an old man bent double with age. From behind she could see his white beard spread out on the rocky floor in front of him. He did not move as she entered, so she passed round that she might stand before him and speak to him. The moment she looked in his face she saw that he was a youth of marvellous beauty. He sat entranced with the delight of what he beheld in a mirror or something like silver, which lay at the floor at his feet, and which, from behind, she had taken for his white beard. He sat on, heedless of her presence, pale with the joy of his vision. She stood and watched him. At length, all trembling, she spoke, but her voice made no sound. Yet the youth lifted up his head. He showed no surprise, however, at seeing her, only smiled a welcome. "'Are you the old man of the earth?' Tangle had said. And the youth answered, and Tangle heard him, though not with her ears. "'I am.' What can I do for you? Tell me the way to the country whence the shadows fall. Ah, that I do not know. I only dream about it myself. I see its shadows sometimes in my mirror. The way to it I do not know. But I think the old man of the fire must know. He is much older than I am. He is the oldest man of all. Where does he live? I will show you the way to his place. I never saw him myself." So saying, the young man rose, then stood for a while gazing at Tangle. "'I wish I could see that country, too,' he said. "'But I must mind my work.' He led her to the side of the cave, and told her to lay her ear against the wall. "'What do you hear?' he asked. I hear, answered Tangle, the sound of a great water running inside the rock. That river runs down to the dwelling of the oldest man of all, the old man of the fire. I wish I could go to see him, but I must mind my work. That river is the only way to him. Then the old man of the earth stooped over the floor of the cave, raising a huge stone from it, and left it leaning. It disclosed a great hole that went plumb down. That is the way, he said. But there are no stairs. You must throw yourself in. There is no other way. She turned and looked at him full in the face, stood so for a whole minute, as she thought. It was a whole year, then threw herself headlong into the hole. When she came to herself she found herself gliding down, fast and deep. Her head was under water, but that did not signify, for when she thought about it she could not remember that she had breathed once since her bath in the cave of the old man of the sea. When she lifted up her head a sudden and fierce heat struck her, and she sank it again instantly, and went sweeping on. Gradually the stream grew shallower. At length she could hardly keep her head under. Then the water could carry her no further. She rose from the channel, and went step for step down the burning descent. The water ceased altogether. The heat was terrible. She felt scorched to the bone, 
but it did not touch her strength. It grew hotter and hotter. She said, I can bear it no longer. Yet she went on. At the long last the stair ended at a rude archway in all but glowing rock. Through this archway Tangle fell exhausted into a cool mossy cave. The floor and walls were covered with moss, green, soft, and damp. A little stream spouted from a rent in the rock and fell into a basin of moss. She plunged her face into it and drank. Then she lifted her head and looked around. Then she rose and looked again. She saw no one in the cave. But the moment she stood upright she had a marvellous sense that she was in the secret of the earth and all its ways. Everything she had seen or learned from books, all that her grandmother had said or sung to her, all the talk of the beasts, birds, and fishes, all that had happened to her on her journey with Mossy, and since then in the heart of the earth, with the old man and the older man, all was plain. She understood it all, and saw that everything meant the same thing, though she could not have put it into words again. The next moment she decried, in a corner of the cave, a little naked child sitting on the moss. He was playing with balls of various colours and sizes, which he disposed in strange figures upon the floor beside him. And now Tangle felt that there was something in her knowledge which was not in her understanding, for she knew there must be an infinite meaning in the change in sequence and individual forms of the figures into which the child arranged the balls, as well as in the varied harmonies of their colours, but what it all meant she could not tell. He went on busily, tirelessly playing his solitary game, without looking up, or seeming to know that there was a stranger in his deep withdrawn cell. Diligently as a lace-maker shifts her bobbins, he shifted and arranged his balls. Flashes of meaning would now pass from them to tangle, and now again all would not be merely obscure but utterly dark. She stood looking for a long time, for there was fascination in the sight, and the longer she looked, the more an indescribable vague intelligence went on rousing itself in her mind. For seven years she stood there watching the naked child with his coloured balls, and it seemed to her like seven hours, when all at once the shape the balls took, she knew not why, reminded her of the Valley of Shadows, and she spoke. "'Where is the old man of the fire?' she said. "'Here I am,' answered the child, rising and leaving his balls on the moss. "'What can I do for you?' There was such an awfulness of absolute repose on the face of the child that Tangle stood dumb before him. He had no smile, but the love in his large grey eyes was deep as the centre. And with the repose there lay on his face a shimmer as of moonlight, which seemed as if any moment it might break into such a ravishing smile as would cause the beholder to weep himself unto death. But the smile never came, and the moonlight lay there unbroken, for the heart of the child was too deep for any smile to reach from it to his face. "'Are you the oldest man of all?' Tangle, at length, although filled with awe, ventured to ask. "'Yes, I am. I am very, very old.' I am able to help you, I know. I can help everybody." And the child drew near and looked up in her face so that she burst into tears. "'Can you tell me the way to the country the shadows fall from?' she sobbed. "'Yes. I know the way quite well. I go there myself sometimes. But you could not go my way. You are not old enough. I will show you how you can go. Do not send me out into the great heat again, prayed Tangle. I will not, answered the child. And he reached up and put his little cool hand on her heart. Now, he said, you can go. The fire will not burn you. Come. He led her from the cave, and following him through another archway, she found herself in a vast desert of sand and rock. The sky of it was of rock, lowering over them like solid thunderclouds and the whole place was so hot that she saw in bright rivulets the yellow gold and white silver and red copper 
trickling molten from the rocks. But the heat never came near her. When they had gone some distance, the child turned up a great stone, and took something like an egg from under it. He next drew a long curved line in the sand with his finger, and laid the egg in it. He then spoke something Tangle could not understand. The egg broke. A small snake came out, and, lying in the line in the sand, grew and grew till he filled it. The moment he was full-grown, he began to glide away, undulating like a sea-wave. "'Follow the serpent,' said the child. "'He will lead you the right way.' Tangle followed the serpent. But she could not go far without looking back at the marvellous child. He stood alone in the midst of the glowing desert, beside a fountain of red flame that had burst forth at his feet. His naked whiteness glimmering a pale rosy red the torrid fire. There he stood, looking after her, till, from the lengthening distance, she could see him no more. The serpent went straight on, turning neither to the right nor left. Meantime, Mossy had got out of the Lake of Shadows, and, following his mournful, lonely way, had reached the seashore. It was a dark, stormy evening. The sun had set. The wind was blowing from the sea. The waves had surrounded the rock within which lay the old man's house. A deep water rolled between it and the shore, upon which a majestic figure was walking alone. Mossy went up to him, and said, "'Will you tell me where to find the old man of the sea?' "'I am the old man of the sea,' the figure answered. "'I see a strong, kingly man of middle age,' returned Mossy. Then the old man looked at him more intently, and said, "'Your sight, young man, is better than that of most who take this way. "'The night is stormy. Come to my house, and tell me what I can do for you.' Mossy followed him. The waves flew from before the footsteps of the old man of the sea, and Mossy followed upon dry sand. When they had reached the cave, they sat down and gazed at each other. Now Mossy was an old man by this time. He looked much older than the old man of the sea, and his feet were very weary. After looking at him for a moment, the old man took him by the hand and led him into his inner cave. There he helped him to undress, and laid him in the bath. And he saw that one of his hands, Mossy, did not open. "'What have you in that hand?' he asked. Mossy opened his hand, and there lay the golden key. "'Ah!' said the old man. "'That accounts for your knowing me. And I know the way you have to go. I want to find the country whence the shadows fall.' said Mossy. I dare say you do. So do I. But meantime, one thing is certain. What is that key for, do you think? For a keyhole somewhere. But I don't know why I keep it. I never could find the keyhole. And I have lived a good while, I believe, said Mossy, sadly. I'm not sure that I'm not old. I know my feet ache. Do they? said the old man as if he really meant to ask the question, and Mossy, who was still lying in the bath, watched his feet for a moment, before he replied, "'No, they do not. Perhaps I am not old either. Get up and look at yourself in the water.' He rose and looked at himself in the water, and there was not a grey hair on his head or a wrinkle on his skin. "'You have tasted of death now,' said the old man. "'Is it good?' "'It is good,' said Mossy. "'It is better than life.' "'No,' said the old man. "'It is only more life. "'Your feet will make no holes in the water now.' "'What do you mean?' "'I will show you that presently.' They returned to the outer cave, and sat and talked together for a long time. At length the old man of the sea rose, and said to Mossy, "'Follow me.' He led him up the stair again and opened another door. They stood on the level of the raging sea, looking towards the east. Across the waste of waters, against the bosom of a fierce black cloud, stood the foot of a rainbow, glowing in the dark. 
"'This indeed is my way,' said Mossy, as soon as he saw the rainbow, and stepped out upon the sea. His feet made no holes in the water. He fought the wind, and climbed the waves, and went on towards the rainbow. The storm died away. A lovely day and a lovelier night followed. A cool wind blew over the wide plain of the quiet ocean, and still Mossy journeyed eastward. But the rainbow had vanished with the storm. Day after day he held on, and he thought he had no guide. He did not see how a shining fish under the water directed his steps. He crossed the sea, and came to a great precipice of rock, up which he could discover but one path. Nor did this lead him further than halfway up the rock, where it ended on a platform. Here he stood and pondered. It could not be that the way stopped here, else what was the path for? It was a rough path, not very plain, yet certainly a path. He examined the face of the rock. It was smooth as glass, but as his eyes kept roving hopelessly over it, something glittered, and he caught sight of a row of small sapphires. They bordered a little hole in the rock. "'The keyhole!' he cried. He tried the key. It fitted. It turned. A great clang and clash, as of iron bolts on huge brazen cauldrons, echoed thunderously within. He drew out the key. The rock in front of him began to fall. He retreated from it as far as the breadth of the platform would allow. A great slab fell at his feet. In front was still the solid rock, with this one slab fallen forward out of it, but the moment he stepped upon it, a second fell, just short of the first, making the next step of a stair, which thus kept dropping itself before him as he ascended into the heart of the precipice. It led him into a hall fit for such an approach, irregular and rude in formation, but floor, sides, pillars, and vaulted roof, all one mass of shining stones of every colour that light can show. In the centre stood seven columns, ranged from red to violet, and on the pedestal of one of them sat a woman, motionless, with her face bowed upon her knees. Seven years had she sat there, waiting. She lifted her head as Mossy drew near. It was Tangle. Her hair had grown to her feet, and was rippled like the windless sea on broad sands. Her face was beautiful, like her grandmother's, and as still and peaceful as that of the old man of the fire. Her form was tall and noble, yet Mossy knew her at once. "'How beautiful you are, Tangle!' he said, in delight and astonishment. "'Am I?' she returned. "'Oh, I have waited for you so long! But you, you are like the old man of the sea. N no, you are like the old man of the earth. No, no, you are like the oldest man of all. You are like them all.' And yet you are my own old Mossy. How did you come here? What did you do after I lost you? Did you find the keyhole? Have you got the key still? She had a hundred questions to ask him, and he a hundred more to ask her. They told each other all their adventures, and were as happy as man and woman could be, for they were younger and better and stronger and wiser than they had ever been before. It began to grow dark, and they wanted more than ever to reach the country whence the shadows fall, so they looked about them for a way out of the cave. The door by which Mossy entered had closed again, and there was half a mile of rock between them and the sea. Neither could Tangle find the opening in the floor by which the serpent had led her thither. They searched till it grew so dark that they could see nothing, and gave it up. After a while, however, the cave began to glimmer again. The light came from the moon, but it did not look like moonlight, for it gleamed through those seven pillars in the middle, and filled the place with all colours. And now Mossy saw that there was a pillar beside the red one, which he had not observed before, and it was of the same new colour that he had seen in the rainbow when he saw it first in the fairy forest and on it he saw a sparkle of blue. 
It was the sapphires round the keyhole. He took his key. It turned in the lock to the sound of Aeolian music. A door opened upon slow hinges and disclosed a winding stair within. The key vanished from his fingers. Tangle went up. Mossy followed. The door closed behind them. They climbed out of the earth, and, still climbing, rose above it. They were in the rainbow. Far abroad, over ocean and land, they could see through its transparent walls the earth beneath their feet. Stairs beside stairs wound up together, and beautiful beings of all ages climbed along with them. They knew that they were going up to the country whence the shadows fall. And by this time I think they must have got there. End of the Golden Key